2022 meeting of the Board of Land and Natural Resources. It is 9.02 a.m. Thank you for being here. We're holding this meeting as a hybrid meeting. We're live in the Kalani Moku BLNR boardroom in Honolulu. Those who wish to, fi wish to testify live can do so at this boardroom. And please let our board secretary know which item you wish to testify on. You can email her at blnr.testimony at hawaii.gov. If you've signed up to present or testify via Zoom, you'll be in the waiting room until your agenda item is called, when we'll let you into the main Zoom meeting room. Please remember to turn your audio and video off until you're called on to speak. Also, please remember to turn off your YouTube when you're in the main Zoom meeting room, or we'll get an echo. Please don't use the chat for any comments because that presents a sunshine issue. People may also testify via telephone at the number posted online. Would you please text or email our board secretary your name and the telephone number you're calling from and the agenda item so we can call on you for that item. Members of the public may also watch the meeting on YouTube. We ask that members of the public testifying on agenda items limit your testimony to three minutes so we can get to everyone. And then we also ask that you turn on your video when you're testifying, though that's not required. <clears throat> For COVID protection, we prefer that people who are waiting in the boardroom wear your masks as much as possible. Um, uh, we're, we're now going to read the standard contested case statement. Member Council, would you please read that? Sure. Um, and some of the matters before the board, a person may wish to request a contested case hearing. If such a request is made before the board's decision, then the board will consider the request first before considering the merits of the item before it. A person who wants a contested case may also wait until the board decides the issue then request the contested case after the decision. It is up to you. Any request must be made in writing within 10 days. If no request for contested case is made, the board will make a decision. The department will treat the decision as final and proceed accordingly. Thank you. I will now take a roll call of board members. Please state your name, and if you're participating remotely, please state whether anyone is in the room with you. So I'll start with my far left. Member Smith. Um, present. Um. <laughs> Member Ono. Ono. Present. <laughs> Member Char. Present. Uh, Suzanne Case. Present. Member Yoon. Could you be present? Member Canto. Present. Member Barnes. Uh, I'm present. Uh, my son is currently in the room with me, but will not be here very long. My family is at the house, but will not be in the room. Okay, thank you very much. And we're going to hear agenda items in the following order. If you have a scheduling problem, please let our board secretary know and we will um, try to shuffle it around. Uh, so first we're going to hear the minutes A1, then we're going to hear the M items, and then we're going to hear L, and then we're going to hear D7, then we're going to hear the E items, and then we are going to uh, go back and go in order, unless somebody else needs to move up. Okay, with that, yes, you're here for the E items, right? Okay. So, with that, we're going to go to the, the minutes of the June 6, 2022 meeting. Board members, do you have any comments on those minutes? I don't have any public testimony on it. So moved, Chair. Moved, Chair. 
Approve. Okay. Second. Seconds from Ono. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Um, okay. I'm just going to do uh, call out names for the first vote. That's Case Yoon, Char, Smith, Canto, Barnes, and Ono. And Chair, just to confirm, that was June 9th, right? Sorry. Smith, Smith was not there. Right. So Smith abstains. Sorry. Uh, Member Barnes. Again. <clears throat> I just was confirming June 9th. It was the June 9th minutes. I th I thought I heard you say June 6th, but um oh, it does say June 6th. That, that, that was a mistake. So that's June 9th. Thank you. Thank you for that correction. Um okay. I'm going to go to the M items. Hang on one second. Yes. Eric Leong is two five. The OT Harbors. He's the last okay. one. Do we have anybody for highways? Not here. Got lots of All right. Good morning, Ms. LaRue. How are you? Good morning. Okay, I think you're here for M1 through 4. Airports, revocable permits, I'm gonna, and there's no public testimony on the M items. Uh, members, do you have any questions on M1 through 4? Okay, hearing none, is there a motion to approve M1 through 4? Motion to approve. By Barnes and you, and all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. LaRue. Have a Thank great you. weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, M5, Mr. Leong. Um, okay, board members, any questions on M5? <coughs> okay, is there a motion to approve? M5, that's submitted. Motion to approve. Okay. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Leong. Thank you. Okay, M6. M6, we don't have anybody from DOT Highways, so... I have a question. You have a question. Just so, a point of clarification. The, um, the sale of the remnant, is that done by the Department of Transportation or DLNR? And are the funds to DLNR or DOT? Our AG can answer that. It says in the title that it was sold by state, so it would be sold by DLNR to the entity. I'm sorry, I can't hear. Oh. The, it says in the title that the remnant R1 was sold by the state in Liber 12219, and so that would mean that it was sold by uh, DLNR. You, I'm sorry? DLNR. DLNR. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, approval. Um, sorry, okay. Ms. Barnes. Um, I just had a question about it's marked as ceded lands. In the land policies. Um, so I'm just wondering what the implication is for that related to DHHL. Um, you mean, does DHHL get 30% of the revenues of the sale? Again, maybe I can check with our council. It does say that it says that it's ceded land under land title status on page two. So it they would get thirty percent. And uh, did they uh, Okay, and was is there any requirement for advanced consultation with them before we make this decision or we make we are authorized to make the decision and they simply we simply provide them with a thirty percent? I would say um, make an amendment to the recommendation to reflect that it should, that 
CEHL shall receive 30% of proceeds? I, I can't really speak for DOT, frankly, but um, um, the other option is to pass it to some other time when the DOT representative is present. Yeah, I don't mind doing that. DOT often is not present, and so I think that would be helpful. Okay, uh, if you are all in agreement, we'll defer. M6, uh, so that we can get further questions. Okay, uh, next we are going to go to L. Hang on one second. I think we can go ahead, let's see. Was it? Okay, Mr. Carrada. Wanna go ahead with L1? Sure. Good good morning, Chair. Good morning, board. Um agenda item L1 is um a desire for the Department of Land and Natural Resources to enter into an MOU with the Friends of Iolani Palace. Uh, we um, want to um, utilize grant funds that the palace has um, um, sought from uh, National Park Services. Um, I have um, Jason, I think, with me and um, Paula Kana. We're working on the project together. So um, together we um, put together uh, a project to take a look at their, um, their situation with their roof. Uh, the money primarily will be used to take care of um, a roof leak. Uh, other, if, if there is anything left of this um, funding, we'd um, like to take a look at other miscellaneous repairs. Uh, I can give you more background on it. Uh, it's mostly technical. Uh, so we're um, proposing that the um, chair be um, granted the uh, authority to um, allow us to um, enter into an MOU with the friends to utilize national park money on this project. The recommendation is to um, um, grant, delegate the authority to the chairperson for this. Uh, the uh, project has been um, vetted through procurement of 103D. Uh, we, the attorney general has reviewed it. Um, we we hope we hope for um, your concurrence with this. Available for questions. Thank you, and I see we have um, Akana here from Friends of Yulani Palace or from Yulani Palace. Welcome. Yes. Did you want to add anything? Good morning. No, I um, I just. Um, Ask that you pass this. Um, it's it's an important part of the piece of the puzzle in being able to utilize the National Parks um, Secretary of Interior funding for this. Um, the roof's been leaking for ten years, and and this is our chance to finally get it fixed. And we're delighted that um, DLNR has agreed to, you know, match and work with the federal funding. So, um, if you have any other questions, we just we just uh, we'd like to Thank see you. this happen. And I will say I've personally observed the leaking roof and I'm looking forward to uh, you being able to fix it. Yep. Uh, anybody else want to say anything? Kurt, you want to add anything? Uh, oh. um, okay, any questions? Go ahead, Kurt. I just wanted to echo uh, Paula Akana's um, statement. You know, we really appreciate this long-standing relationship with the friends of Iolani Palace 
And the palace is, is an aging asset. And there's uh, Paula can give you a laundry list of all of the, the fixes, but this is the big one. We need to protect the antiquities and the integrity of the palace itself. And it's more than just fixing a leak. The roof is slate. And so I suspect um, once they get into it, there's gonna be a pretty major redo of, of the entire roof of the palace. Long overdue. Anyway, thank you. Do we know why it's taken so long, 10 years, to come to this? Yeah. Um, prior to Ms. Akana's leadership as the executive director, the previous ED uh, was not nearly as communicative or um, engaged with, with state parks. Um, I give a lot of kudos to, to Paula. She came in, you know, and fully started doing an asset management uh <laughs> evaluation and, and she's been very you know we, we have a great working relationship we've been trying to get this money through the legislature the past couple of years so that was also part of it right just getting you know what initially was about eight hundred thousand dollars in capital funds but it's all secured and ready to go and with engineering's help and with paula's grant we should be able to you know get this thing cooking thank you Amy. yeah is uh I don't know if this question for Jimmy or Kurt, but um, the existing slate is it is it is it going to be re, uh, replaced with slate? Yeah. What does um, the, the 106 say? I think we got to. Yeah. So the technique is to remove and try to salvage as much as the slate, the original slate, as possible. Um, whatever slate is rather um, hard, so it um, tends to fracture if you um, flex it too much. We, we expect um, some damage from the, um, the removal to um, get to where the leak is and um, waterproof and um, rebuild, rebuild the roof. They're going to have to um, come back with a matching slate color to um, replace the damage, damaged slate one um, because the slate is the protective layer for the, uh, the fireproofing and the waterproofing. Right, right. You know, some of my concern is, you, you know, is, is the 106 plus the, the review time at Shifty, you know what I mean? So we really need to get that roof on there as quickly as possible. I would reach out to Shifty and ask him, is slate absolutely necessary? I think there are some alternatives, like ergo, like uh, the state capitol. Before, the, the, the underside of the roof, roofing, the sweeps were tile, these small blue tile. Yes. Um, but through coordination, we, we just painted it the same color of blue, right? So there are some... I give that an example because there are some, there may be some alternate uh, ways of handling this much cheaper than slate. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I saw what was done at the, the Capitol and we're prepared to go there if um, the slate becomes, the slate look, texture, color, so forth becomes a, an issue. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Okay. All favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Passes unanimously. All right, good luck with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Uh, okay, next uh, we're going to go to D7. Okay, I, let me, let me see. Um, sure. Mr. Cook, are you there? Yeah, you are. Okay. All right, D7, uh, Rafa Suji, please go ahead. Yeah, good morning, board members. Uh, D7 is a presentation or a request before the board for uh, the issuance of a write up. A uh, revocable permit to be effective uh, upon the expiration of the current lease, which is set in November of 2022. 
uh, we laid out, uh, just to give you some background, this is previously under um, a lease uh, for this cable operation out to AT&T, subsequently assigned to Tyco, and then now uh, assigned to Subcom. Subcom had previously indicated that they uh, uh, wished to, uh, did not wish to extend the lease and was looking towards uh, relocating. Uh, and that was in uh, discussions for several years. DAR expressed an interest in acquiring the site for its expansion of its, uh, uh, this, coral, uh, this coral program they have out there at their facility. Uh, at the end of the day though, uh, Subcom decided it was best to at least stay at the current location uh, for a while at, as to a portion of the property. So what we have before you is a division of what is coming back to the state in November and being apportioned out. And, and we, so it's a various parties are involved, the DOT harbors, uh, which this is in the Honolulu Harbor area. Uh, we'll take the pier uh, area and have exclusive jurisdiction over there to the extent that Subcom wanna, wants to use it or needs to use it at certain times during emergencies, then they'll make arrangements with deal, directly with DOT Harbors uh, and pay uh, whatever fee DOT Harbors requires uh, there. DAR will be taken back, as you can see in the submittal, the, the, the warehouse area. And Subcom will be having the right to utilize what they call the Panyard area. And it's outlined in, in yellow in the, in the map attached to the submittal. Uh, for the RP purposes, until, you know, I, I think for a longer term, we're probably going to come back for a longer term disposition for this area, the yellow area, uh, uh, under a maritime uh, provision uh, for a direct negotiation. But that's to come back later to the board. For now, the subcom is proposing uh, that we keep the rent the same, uh, which is currently at the uh, 81 cents per square foot uh, comes out about $9.71 per year per square foot. Um, the area that they're reserving is this yellow area, which is 32,200 square feet. But for the purposes of the RP, uh, they would, the proposal is to pay for a portion only for the amount that they utilize. And, and what happened was apparently they lost one of their. Uh, uh, clients, uh, a large client, and supposedly use only a portion of the 32,000, 33,200 square feet. And, and so um, what the proposal is today that they pay for a portion of that to the extent that they fill the space and uh, find another client, uh, they will pay the higher, the full amount for whatever they utilize. My staff uh, is available to testify if you have any questions, as well as I believe uh, Mr. Pace is here from uh, Homeland Security, who have submitted testimony uh, in support. And I believe uh, we, I, I hope we have the subcom representative as well. Thank you. Thank you. We do. Thank you for that. We do have uh, Mr. Cook from subcom. Did you want to add anything or be available for questions? Sorry, no, he, uh, he, he very well covered uh, what we're looking to do. We're looking to maintain the pan yard um, and uh, looking for opportunities to expand our customer base over the next year. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Pace? Uh, good morning, Chair. Good morning, members of the board. Uh, I'm Frank Pace and the administrator for the Hawaii Office of Homeland Security. Uh, the, the reason why I'm testifying here today is my office in part is responsible for in, ensuring the protection of the critical infrastructure uh, within the state of Hawaii and communications and our ability to communicate is a, is a, a key sector of that. Um, as stated in my testimony, uh, subcom uh, and, and, and in part, our responsibilities are to work with both our public and private partners. Subcom, um, as a uh, 30 plus year tenant uh, at their facility, provides a vital service. Uh, which uh, services the undersea cables uh, that do uh, connect Hawaii with the rest of the world and also in between our counties. 
Um, for our part, we uh, consider this a, a priority and a matter to uh, have their presence here. Uh, without such, um, we would potentially uh, be uh, many weeks or even months um, without the ability to recover quickly from any disruption of the uh, undersea cables, which uh, Subcom does service uh, here to the state. So with that, uh, the uh, position of my office is that uh, we do support and uh, ask for your uh, issuance of the revocable permit for Subcom. And I'm available for any further questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Brian Nielsen from DAR Aquatic Resources, do you want to add anything? No, I think Russell covered it well, but um, available for any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's all we have. Uh, Members, any questions? Mr. Smith. No, I just want to make a statement. Um, in one of my past lives, uh, I managed the construction of a submarine fiber project throughout the state of Hawaii. And um, I just want to put some context into the pan yard. So what happens is, you know, like they mentioned, Hawaii is sort of a hub where you have fiber optic cables within the ocean that connect the West Coast to Far East, to Tahiti, Samoa, Tonga. And each of those pans has a different type of fiber that's stored in them. Because they're submarine fiber, they need to be stored in a saltwater environment, and that keeps them ready to be deployed should there be a problem with a cable anywhere in the Pacific. So what happens is typically, if you look at the picture in your packet, usually there's a ship tied up, and before it used to be owned by Tyco. So if the fiber off of Molokai gets severed, they'll find the fiber that needs to be replaced. They'll come in here, they'll pull out a mile or two miles of cable, they'll put it on that ship, and the ship is supposed to be always available to sail to the place where the cable is severed. They grab the two ends, they float them to the surface, they take this piece that they brought with them, they, they splice the two ends in, and then you have connectivity. So. All of us that have used dial-up before know how slow that is, and we're all used to having fiber optics. And so this enables all the fiber optic cables that connect Hawaii to the rest of the world to be quickly repaired so that you don't have to wait months for the proper materials to be <laughs> delivered to the site where the repair is made. So this is extremely important. I support it. Thank you very much. It's a good description of it. Any other questions? Quick yeah. question for Riley. So when the splice is made, is that permanent? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, Brian, what do you plan to do in that warehouse? So uh, the plan is for expansion of some of our restoration projects. Um, so coral, coral restoration um, and uh, our sea urchin and uh, limo, uh, limo restoration projects as well. Yeah, because I was imagining, I mean, I, I get the, the, the need for the cables, but they drag on the, on the ocean's floor, right? And I'm guessing that's, can you study some of that in that area? So, so um, just to clarify too, um, so uh, this proposal, um, you know, subcom would have full access to the pan yards where the fiber optics are stored, but DAR would be taking over the warehouse um, that currently subcom uh, has uh, use of right now. So DAR would just be um, moving into the warehouse, but but all of the pan yard would still be, you know, um, available for subcom with this proposal. Yeah, I guess I'm just trying to tease out, is there a relationship between the technology and you know the potential harm that it's, it's doing to the ocean's floor. But anyway, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, I missed that. Yeah, I mean not directly that we're working on now. Maybe maybe down the road. Thanks, Brent. And you are doing coral restoration. That's important for the Honolulu Harbor. Uh, Absolutely. Mitigation, yeah. Mitigation okay. for uh, work in the harbor as well. Yes. Yeah, so like the Kapalama Container Terminal expansion that DOT is working on now. Where. We're working with DOT to mitigate um, for the coral loss um, as a result of that expansion. So that's, that's correct. Chair, can I just ask a question to Russell about, um, I see the, the um, or I heard the um, potential for change in the total land area 
used and the cost implications, but Russell, could you just provide a sense of the range of the total rents, depending on how much is used, and then maybe also just a brief explanation of what the process would be for that to change depending on the total area under use? Yeah. As we articulated in the submittal, the, the total area for the yellow, yellow area is 33,200 square feet. We understand that subcom uses, or because they lost their, one, of the, one of their tenants, will be using half of that. And so at this point, my understanding is the rent will be based on half. Or, and so that will be $9.71 square foot per square feet per year. I think it comes out to like 160, about 160,000 a year for half. Um, they were paying, uh, uh, yeah. And so, and if they fill that up for the full area uh, at this time, my understanding that there is through an honor system that they will let us know. And, and certainly DAR is right next door and can inform us that they're utilizing, if they start utilizing more than half of the area. Um, Justin, I mean, you want to explain how you want to proposing it, but that's the proposal before the board is, is they pay for, even though they can utilize the whole 33,200 33, square feet, which I think they would love to, it's just that right now they don't have the tenant to fill that space. Yeah. yeah. That, that's a correct assumption. And, uh, and we would notify immediately if we were going to uh, be bringing in a new client and filling in more space. And, and you know, uh, many would know that we're doing that as the ship would be coming in and we'd be alongside for a long period of time transferring cable from a vessel into those cable pans. So yes, we would, we would notify as soon as possible um, it, before it even happened that we were gonna be bringing in a new client. Okay, and then the, so the, the 160, Russell, that would, the max that would be would be essentially double that if the space was fully Rough, roughly that was my calculation this morning yeah. was about 160 i think for half of it yeah. a year and, then, and yeah. that would be something that would need to come back to the board that would just be something that you would we'll work do out. administratively yes we wouldn't have to bring that that before the board okay so okay the long-term lease uh once yeah. it goes through the process, the appraisal process for the long-term lease would come back to the board. The rent adjustment based on whatever amount is in use would be handled at the land division level. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, one last one. Russell, so the, the shared access, everybody kind of contributes to that? Is that how that works? That, that is my understanding. I don't know if we got down to the nitty gritty details yet, but that is my understanding. Typically when we have shared access, everybody will have to contribute to maintain that area. Yes. Okay, thank I, you. In this case though, I don't anticipate this RP going really long, but in the end of the day, even if we enter a long-term lease, this arrangement that what you see today is pretty much gonna stay in place. So yes, we would have to definitely nail down when we enter a long-term lease, the, the maintenance obligations of subcom vis-a-vis -vis everybody else, DAR and, and DOT Harbors. Yeah, because yeah, what, the utility is running through that access on the ground? Is that where the utility is? No. no? The, the electrical lines you're talking about? Yeah, electrical, all of that. Uh, oh, you mean to the warehouse? Yeah, to service the areas. Well, I don't... I don't I, as to the panyard, I don't believe they need utilities. Correct me if I'm wrong, Justin. Light, lighting would be needed, um, it, which it's okay. currently lit at night. So yes, there would be something. Um, and, and we can bring in a generator to, uh, for that as well if we had to. But uh, lighting would question. definitely be necessary. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Thank you, Russell. Yeah. Not, is there a motion to approve D7 as submitted? So moved. All right. Second from Ono. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you very much, and thank you for your testimony and explanation. Have a good day.
Okay, we're going to move to uh, the the E items, and then we will go back in order in the agenda. Okay, uh, E-items, so Mr. Cottrell, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair, members of the board, Kurt Cottrell, Administrator for the Division of State Parks. Um, we have a, a, okay, a okay day for you guys today. Uh, we have a bundle of items with a variety of actions that we need your approval on. Before we um, jump into the E-items, I would like to introduce uh, Keiki uh, Kipapa and Corinne Gowan, who are, uh, should be um, on the screen. I wanted you to see that is the full power of our property management uh, staff for state parks right now. We're down one position and Alan is pulling double duty as the supervisor of property management filling in for the vacant property manager position. But these two Wahines are responsible for all of the leases, all of the RPs, all of the concession agreements. Um, and it's a big load. And I just wanted you guys to meet them, but I don't, I don't see them on the screen. I thought we had given them an invite. Um, with that, um, item E1 is a reassignment. E2 and E3 are forfeitures. Uh, and E4 is the long awaited uh, public auction for seven vacant recreational cabins. And with your permission on E4, Alan's gonna uh, present that one because Koke and Kawhi is kind of his baby. But I thought it would be interesting for the board to hear both Alan and if uh, Chipper is on a brief history of the Koke recreational residences because it is a unique uh, and one of a kind element in our state park system. So with that, item E1 is a pretty much straight up reassignment. Consent to assign general lease number SP0161, uh, Karen Bellavita, a signer to Michelle Rose uh, at lot 51, Koke'e Camp Lots, uh, Waimea Kona uh, on Kauai. So that one is, is a straight up reassignment. Okay. Um, Chipper, did you want to go ahead and you're signed up for all four? Do you want to go ahead and background? Yeah. Sure. And um, I promise, folks, I'm not going to repeat all my testimony on every agenda <laughs> item. But but when we get to four, I'm going to add a little a little more. But uh, for uh, as Kurt said, this um, historic community in Koke is absolutely unique. It's not replicated anywhere else in the state. And the cabin that you see behind me in my background was built by my great grand uncle um, in 1920. So it's over a hundred years old. And about that same period of time, the, the federal government was beginning to create recreational residences in their national forest. And this territory of Hawaii jumped on that program and, um, and basically opened up three areas uh, up at Koke for, for, for camp lots. And uh, that's Halimanu, the Koke camp lots and uh, Pukapele. And, and so those are the three areas that at, at, in, at its peak, we had well over a hundred uh, recreational residents up there. And uh, we're now down to roughly about 90. And, you know, the, the thing that's really amazing about this is that this historic community was built really with the blood, sweat and tear and, and funding of the residents of Kauai. Um, and, and that provided them with a very strong incentive to maintain these properties. That all changed in 1985 when the uh, DLNR decided to take a different approach and uh, put the, the, the lots up for auction and the successful bidders in that auction had to sign a lease that surrendered all of their capital improvements with no compensation to the state of Hawaii. That continues to create some issues. The most 
the biggest one, I think, from the state's perspective, and you'll see some references uh, to HRS in my, in my uh, testimony, is that the state has a legal responsibility to maintain this, this historic and cultural properties. And that is now put entirely on the back of the lessees. So the lessees, having lessees that want to be there, that want to play ball at state parks, is in my opinion, absolutely essential. And to that end, I got myself elected a few years ago to as the president of the Cocaine Leaseholder Association because of the really amazing working relationship I've developed with parks through our relationship in Hyena over the past 20, 30 years. I wanted to extend that up to Cocaine. And we're in the process of, of doing that. It's too bad you can't see KK and Corrine because I agree with Kurt. I mean, they're, it's pretty amazing. And we get to agenda item four, you know, this is long overdue, but when Sang left uh, the division, it left them really without the capacity to go to auction. But getting back to the point of the, of the transfer here, the successful transfer of this cabin will ensure that it ends up in the hands of somebody who wants to, who wants to put the money into maintaining it and taking care of it and treating it as an extension of, of, of their home. We all are up there simply at the pleasure of state parks. None of us own any property. Um, and so I believe the more we can do to build a friendly, working, collaborative relationship similar to what you heard with Iolani Palace, the better off we are, the better off the state of Hawaii is, the better off our historic community is, and the better off the lessees are. So I'm fully supportive of this agenda item. And I'll give you a little more color when we get to, to number four. But Alan or Kurt, anything you want to add to that? I mean, I really condensed the hundred year history. It could have gone on and on, but um, I think you get the, the picture there. Um, no, just that, thank you. Alan Carpenter, Assistant Administrator for State Parks. Uh, I would simply add that um, we, we agree that Koke is, you know, one of the most unique assets in the state, that collection of cabins um, Seventy-five percent are eligible for listing on the, the state or national register. Um, they have, you know, they were largely built in the early twentieth century, as Chipper noted. There, um, some are over hundred years old. Old houses are difficult to take care of, and um, we have been um, party to a little bit of benign neglect. And you know, they need to be lived in. They need to have people who, who want to enjoy them and, and maintain them. So this is critical. And again, I'm, I'm jumping ahead to number four. Um, but I would, I would simply add that, you know, these are, I think there's maybe three sort of native vernacular styles of architecture that developed in Hawaii. The first being um, indigenous architecture, the native Hawaiian architecture, the second being plantation era architecture. And I think Koke qualifies as a third, right? So they are literally, um, they were invented here and uh, they do add tremendously to the character of the park and, um, they are um, something that, that had they have been cherished for generations, and uh, you know, uh, I, I'm not as uh, eloquent as Chipper, but I just wanted to express my agreement with what he's saying and the need to create some succession plan for about five to seven years from now, when the bulk of the hundred come up for um, a new process. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we have Corinne here going. Great. So that's 50% of our property management staff capacity. <laughs> Thank you for all your work. I know it's a lot of work. Um, a question? Yeah. Um, so, um, Alan, I know you mentioned the sort of um, benign neglect and the need to have these spaces inhabited or activated. I'm just noticing on this, the transfer, it looks like the transferor is California based. And, and I know looking just, I'm not very familiar with these cabins, but looking online, it looks like a lot of them are available for vacation rental. So is the, is the purpose to have people living in these as their primary residence, or is the idea to have them be additional vacation units? 
Good, good question. And I, I'd like to clarify a little bit. There are short-term rentals available up there, um, rented by the lodge and a number of nonprofits, including uh, Camp Slogan, Camp Holicoa. They're traditional. Those are traditional church camps with multi-units developed um, over time for a very different reason. The recreational residence lots, by definition, are they are leased to a single family and they are only, or entity, they are only available for, for use by that family or their friends. No commercial use is allowed at all. And they're limited to approximately, I think it's 50%, right? So they are in effect second homes, weekend homes. Historically, they were a way for families to bond, get out of the Waimea and Kekaha heat and go up the mountain in the summer. Um, so no, their, their intent is to be put into the hands of one family who will take care of them. Many of them remain in the, in the hands of the uh, successors of the families that built them, right? So, and Chipper's the, the living example of that. And so, no, they are not available for, um, for individual rental. That would be a short-term rental use would be a violation of the lease. Yeah, no subletting. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. And then do you have any statistics on how many of the, um, the leaseholders are um, state residents versus out of state? So I'm gonna delve into a, more of a little bit of the future. So the, the people, there's, there's essentially two categories of lessees up there. Those who held them at the end of the last lease period, 2007-ish, um, they were allowed under um, the act that is appended to the, um, I think the fourth submittal, to stay in their cabins and keep them at an appraised rate. There was no selection or no criteria for where those people were from or how they obtained those cabins at that time. So, but for those that were released and auctioned at that same time, 2009, 2000. I think it was 2009, there is a three-tiered system set up in the act. And the first tier, basically, it, it, they go to residents of a county of less than 100,000 population, which I think we can all see what, what county that would apply to. Um, and so they are, in effect, available to them first, then state residents. And then after that, uh, it would go to a wider. So there'd be three separate auctions depending on how the first year goes. We've never gone beyond the first year. Awesome, thank you for clarifying. Okay, any other general questions? Yeah, general question. Chipper, how come you get to work on all the cool projects? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> be, 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 because I live on the coolest island, bro. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my question is, do we, do we have a sense, a rough order of magnitude of how much the, the rehabilitation costs are going to be? You know, it, it, it's, it's, um, it, it varies cabin to cabin, and it, and it varies also depending on, as we all know, I mean, you guys just saw the Yolani Palace issue, right? If you defer it and kick it down the road, it's going to cost you more. And so for these cabins that have been retained in these families that have this connection, we generally try and keep them up, right? So we're, you know, and the big ones that are we're, we're really looking at are like roof replacements, things like that, uh, just like with, with the palace. Um, so, but I know of a cabin that recently, I mean, they put hundreds of thousands of dollars into, into, into uh, restoring it. And it was a beautiful, authentic restoration. One of the things that we haven't talked about is the fact that I, I, I think it was the, Don Dunsing uh, produced the design guidelines to really help articulate the proper way to maintain and restore these properties. It's an extensive document. Just this last week, I had a Zoom call with the head of the national system for region five. She manages over 6,400 cabins. She was so impressed with our design guidelines. She said it exceeds anything they've got in their, in their system. Um, unfortunately, it's a little too complicated for the lay person to really uh, un understand. So we're working, KLA is working to try and simplify that um, as part of an updated historic cabin survey. That survey is underway right now. We hope to be able to have it done in the next six months. We're doing it for state parks through, qualified, uh, through a qualified individual um, who has the credentials to, to do that. 
that's going to be really revealing to us as to which of the cabins are falling behind, which of the cabins um, are going to need some extensive, um, extensive capital improvement. And then layered on top of that, nothing to do with the historic integrity. Um, and I don't know, this may be premature, but I'm just giving it a heads up, is the issue of replacing all of the cesspools at Coquet with septic systems by 2050. And so how do we do that? You know, we're currently in discussion with Kurt and Alan about, um, about mechanisms to be able to do that. And, and so, you know, it's not insignificant. And we all know, you know, whether we own it or not, we, we look at it as an extension of our homes and we try and maintain it as an extension of our homes. And of course, um, some of us are able to do that ourselves, others, we need contractors to come up there and do it. I, I'm personally a jack of all trades, master of none. So I, I enjoy working on our cabin. I'm trying to replace a hundred year old door handle right now, which is not easy. <laughs> you know, those old square ones. The, the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so is, is, um, is, it currently a, is it currently a historic district? Yeah, it is a historic district. Yes. And correct right me if I'm there. wrong, Alan, in terms of that actual designation, but um, Actually, yeah. I believe it is. Yeah, I think it's not. It is not on the register. So that's why I said earlier, they're all okay. they're eligible. About 75% are eligible. eligible. Um, and I think we certainly could. We, we certainly could and maybe should, right? As we... Um, yeah, you might want to think about that. I mean, I think there's some tax credits and other incentives that you guys could apply for that could help defer some of these costs because they're going to be in the hundreds of thousands. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that's what I was suspected. You know, plus yeah. successful issues. I mean, ugh. So... All right, thanks. Chair, I just want to add one piece um, and it kind of dovetails with board member Yoon's uh, line of reasoning. This last session, we got 28 new positions. One of the ones we asked for was specifically a fourth property manager position for the island of Kauai. And so once we can get that position up and running uh, because we have such a preponderance of, of lessees and lease issues on Kauai, it merits its own property manager and that property manager would work very closely with the Koke'e Leaseholders Association on, you know, drilling into some of these issues. And it's timely, you know, in regards to the IWS versus cesspool related um, transition that we're, you know, going to be looking at. I would just add to member Yoon's point <clears throat> about the opportunities for, you know, federal funding. I mean, cesspools obviously are one area where the EPA is going to have has and is going to have a lot of funding coming through for that. So this strikes me as a excellent opportunity to take advantage of some of that funding and potentially wrap a number of improvements together. It, it's a re, it's a really great suggestion. I believe that 20 years ago, Don Dunsing suggested that it was enacted on the update of this historic cabin survey would be an ideal time because then we'll have current documentation on the status of the resource up there. And that would be a great time to move forward. And I completely agree. We've got to, we've got to look at a, creating a nexus for uh, external funding because to put the cost of all of this on the back of the lessees is just really, it, you know, some of them can afford it, but others cannot. And we're very proud that we got a diverse community up there. Yeah, we do have wealthy people and we you know, we, we may even have a few legacy out of state people, but for a large degree, you know, you got hunters and people like that that have cabins up there and they, they can't afford that kind of stuff. So we're trying to, as an association, we're trying to create a mechanism to be able to support the entire community, which you're going to hear a little bit more when we get to agenda item four, uh, our cabin rescue committee. I want to add that, uh, Kiki's on the screen now. She joined. Oh. She's sitting next to Kareem. So there you go. There's 100% of State Park <laughs> property management. <laughs> and, they, and they are awesome to work with. Okay, uh, Member Ono, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> there's a mention of how many residential units you have. How many vacant lots do you also have? So I know, so that these seven um, cabins that we intend to um, auction in item four represent all but one of the um, available 
unencumbered cabins in the um, landscape. The, the one is a ditchman's cabin down by Pu'ulua, which doesn't have a subdivided lot. And so it will, have, it, it will deserve a different treatment. Um, the number of lots, um, I don't have it off the top of my head. Corinne or Keiki, you may have it, but it is, it, it's, I would say it's about, it might add another 25%. Um, and so they are lots of record without cabins on them. Um, some are on the edge of the canyon. Some are in the wellhead protection zone, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And there's no intent to develop those to, in order to keep view sheds and um, protect the watershed. But um, there, that is a, a question worth considering, right? Making additional undeveloped lots available down the road. Um, and and we're, we've gone all over the place, but one issue that we have not addressed is the fact that these cabins are all 103 at the end of today will be end up in the, the sort of exclusive use of a single family for 20 years. Um, many, many people would like to go up and enjoy this experience. And so the, there, there is an option uh, mentioned in our master plan to pull either some of these or build some new ones on the vacant lots that would allow people to use them as short-term rentals and thereby you know, get the same experience that the landed gentry get. Yeah. And so that, that will be coming down the road, I, I hope, but um, it, it's gonna be the subject of much discussion um, between us and the leaseholders and you know, a lot of soul searching involved there. How much do we wanna to add to the landscape? Just, just a sure. point of clarification, and, and Alan, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that it is legally permitted that some of these are actually held the lease by a hui, which is, which is really extends deep into the community, the number of people are using it. So it's not just an exclusive family use, but quite a few of these, especially as the prices went up and up, um, it became cost you know, prohibitive for a local family. So they've formed HUIs, which actually has been very advantageous because it, it, it creates a, an opportunity for more of our community to be able to enjoy it. And even for the ones held by a family, um, we are not allowed to rent them or lease them, but we all share our cabins with members of the community. And our, our mayor being a classic example of that. I mean, his cabin is used by probably 20 different families throughout the course of a year. Um, so it's, it's um, yeah, it's a, super important to us that the community be able to have access to this resource. Yep, good point, Chipper. I think the perfect example of that is I believe Wilcox Hospital has one and they, you know, so they let some of their stressed out doctors, I think particularly during COVID go up and, and get a little R&R &R from, from the pandemic. So yeah, good point. So I want to, um, to Ka'ibi's point, let's say successful as versus septic. Does the county of Kauai, would they consider grandfathering those uh, cabins currently, you know, using cesspools? Would that be an option to discuss with the county of Kauai? Uh, uh I believe that the only person who, the only agency that has a say over, over septic systems is the State Department of Health, which has a Kauai County division or office. Um, it's, not, it's not up to the county. I don't even think they approve systems. Only the Department of Health does. And um, Correct. I, 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 don't, I, I don't think they would grant us an exemption. I mean, we're all looking down, you know, 20 years down the road, plus, I mean, 2050 is the drop dead date. But we are, you know, as responsible land managers and, you know, we're talking about watersheds and forests, uh, we might want to be proactive in terms of fast tracking these things through incentives rather than let them continue for another 25 years. Um, even though we're still on E1 for the reassignment, since we unpacked everything, I do want to add that in addition to IWS, there's alternative waste technology on the market that might be more cost effective, such as um, residential incinerator toilets. I've seen uh, demonstrations of those on, on YouTube for like cabins up in Alaska and whatnot. And for the, the low volume of use that these cabins uh, legally are supposed to sustain, we don't necessarily need to put in a septic. The, we, we could look at uh, incinerators, uh, I don't know how DOH would feel about residential compost units, but we, we need to be a little creative rather than just immediately stick more leach fields 
and a septic tank in the ground when the market has changed. And I like the idea of minimizing the human waste impact in the watershed up there with alternate type of waste technology. So those are things we're going to, you know, we've been looking into it already for other park units. So Chipper, that is an option as well. We can talk about with the leaseholders association. Right. And, and we, we are very aware of that. And I think we're all open to it. It's just going to, it's, Whatever it is, it's coming down the line and we're going to have to address it. Also, don't forget, I mean, you guys can, um, I know it sounds funny, but you guys can um, centralize that function so that there's just a mass, you know, one incinerator handling, I don't know, eight toilets, right? So it doesn't have to be within everybody because that's where your cost is, you know, they, they, they start growing. But I don't know, I think we have to really look at, think outside the box on this one because it's going to be very expensive. Yeah, agreed. Can I, um, can I ask one other question just about <clears throat> the, um, the, it looks like the annual rental rates um, or items one through three range from sort of in the fives to the nines. Do we have a sense of um, what, as we're looking to the approval for these additional seven leases and then when the majority of the hundred ish come up what the sort of market value is that we expect those will bear i believe that the average more or less um cake you can correct me if i'm wrong i think the average appraised rate for these is about five thousand right so out of these hundred we the state parks we generate about a half a million right from all of these rents collectively um they do range, I mean, some are as low as, you know, 2,500. Um, I think one of the ones that will go out to auction, the, the appraiser basically felt the building has almost zero land, zero value. So it is probably going to be an upset price of land only. Um, and I think, I think the highest rate, and this is of course through auction, right, um, is 18,500 a year. And that's for a pretty um, spectacular cabin, one of the like top two, in terms of historic integrity and, and lot size and all that. So that's kind of kind of the range, right? A couple thousand to 20,000 right in there. And although, again, we're getting ahead of, ahead of ourselves, but the uh, uh, if we include a provision to convert to septic this time, we don't have a real easy way to appraise what that, what that value would be. So what we, we do is probably use the rules in the um, auction and um, lower the upset bid price to um you know very low so that and, and we want everybody to go in eyes wide open right? they're gonna they're gonna have to both uh improve a dilapidated structure in some cases and put in a septic system that's a daunting um fiscal task ahead of them and so we'll, we'll have to recognize that through rent in some way uh, but the flip side of that is the pent-up demand for these things may may mean they all go well over market value it, it yeah, was, my follow-up question could you maybe just for the uninitiated of us describe in a little bit more detail how the auction process actually works and it, so you know five to teen twenties is sort of the range of the price but if somebody really wants one and comes in and bids you know fifty thousand dollars like how does that how does that work they win it it's the highest it's the highest bid right by rule at, for for an auction and um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the last round, uh, which I, again, I think it was 2009, a couple went lower than appraised value because they needed heavy investment, um, but the majority went significantly above. And, and that would still be, usually we sell out in tier one, so it would be a resident of a county of, of less than the, the 100,000. So that opening bid, if it went real high, it would still be somebody from, from here. If you're worried right. about can, can we go ahead and hear E3? I think we have a plane to catch issue here. So let's go ahead with E3. And if you have further questions as we go along, we can ask them. Uh, certainly. So E3, switching gears a little bit here. Uh, E3 is a forfeiture of general lease number SPO 186 to a Mr. Anthony Lucretio at the Pucapele Park lots uh, in Waimea. In, uh, essentially, the tenant is in arrears, um, embarrassingly, for about three years um, on rent. 
And in discussion with uh, board member uh, Riley, just talking story, um, we do have a surety bond of, uh, on record for this particular uh, lessee, but we're asking to forfeit this, this lease. Hey, Mr. Lucrezio, did you want to speak to E3? Thank you. Let me start out by asking Mr. Cottrell when he noticed me of this meeting. Was that date August the 19th? Yes or no? When we noticed you, you mean posting the notice on the cabin door? No, when you noticed that my property would be an agenda item before this board. Oh, you mean when, when we got approval to submit. Um, KQ yes. Karin, do you remember the date that we uh, submitted this, this item and got it approved? Um, I think it was on the, the 16th, maybe okay. last week, Monday. Yeah. So, so roughly a couple weeks ago or, or more or less. Uh, isn't it true, Peggy, that the notice went on the cabin on July 15th, correct? And you put it on under instructions Mr. Cottrell. Uh, no, Keiki didn't put on the notice. Our district superintendent on Kauai placed the notice on the front door. And that you were notified immediately of July 15, the notice was on the door, right? Uh, I believe so. Why did you wait until August the 18th over a weekend to inform this board, for me, that this board would be considering taking my cabin by breaking the lease on this. Isn't it true that you waited over a month and seven days before you let me know if the board members here will check their agendas you will find out that you were noticed way before that date that my cabin was being slated to be taken. Look at your agenda. What date do you have? Can I ask anyone of the board members to tell me? Lucretia, the uh, agendas are posted a week before the board meeting. They're posted. When did the board get them? Or it gets in roughly the same time. Okay. Therefore, one of the points, one of the points uh, Mr. Lucretio, I do need to alert the board to is within the past three years, uh, our property management staff has sent countless certified letters, correspondence, uh, notices of arrears, a variety of things uh, explaining to you both the infractions and the potential repercussions of that. And virtually, I think every single letter, and Kiki and Corinne can attest to this, none of, they were all returned um, unread, unopened. The only documents we've received from you in the past few years uh, are more in the, the vein of you're coming um, toward us with some type of legal action versus responding to the correspondence on how to correct the arrears on your rent. Right, so there has been ample notice that this cabin and this lease is in jeopardy. Um, yeah, and as a matter of fact, <laughs> for, we've given you three years, right? And sent tons of notices, right? The notices where no action was taken. Two years ago, I gave detailed information of why I was not paying the rent because there were literally millions of dollars to my advantage for which the lousy 9,000, the highest in the, all of those leases, were to be taken away from it. Nothing response, speaking of no response. 
no action taken by the Attorney General. And now, we, what I was forced to do was sell the leasehold, my, my, not the leasehold, my property. It was mine. Sus Ono, who was a good board chair, opposed to others, said, when you build a cabin, it will be yours. No one can take it away from you. In 1985, DLNR and Susan Chase took away those cabins by abuse of power of government, which is a racketeering influence, corrupt organization violation. We had to go back 10 years to show that that act occurred more than once. It has now occurred a second time where there was an attempt by Mr. Caldwell to steal the cabin by fraud. He got one of the persons who was using the cabin to say he would pay the rent. And that would end any loss of the cabin. But I ended up smelling a rat, a she-rat and a he-rat through my person in the cabin, Mr. Gonzalez, Dean Gonzalez, who said, yeah, I'll pay the rent. I got the other people are going to help. As I smelled the rats, I checked with the other people. They knew nothing about it. The plan was to have it come up, rent wouldn't be paid, and it would the cabin would go to the Gonzaleses. Mr. 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 Can I ask a, just a point of clarification? Are you saying that you assigned your lease to Mr. Gonzalez and he was going to be no. responsible for no, the rent? No, I did not assign the lease to Mr. Gonzalez. He offered to pay because his group was using the cabin, and I said, fine, go ahead and pay. When I learned board chair, in casement, that's my nickname for you, that in fact, there was never any intention to pay it. I... I'm sorry, what did you address our chair as? In casement is our nickname for it. Uh, you know, Mr. Let me, let me me. No, 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 I'm sorry. Let me I'd like finish. to hear the testimony, but okay. now I just heard I won't you call her in here. anymore. Sorry, I just but you, you as a board member know that she has the power over all of you. Got it. If she doesn't want something to come Mr. before Mr. this Hill. board, she for all my testimony, it. but please be respectful. I, I now be. heard you refer to our chair and others as rats, and that's not going to happen. Mr. What? Mr. what was the last one? Rats. R E T rat. Oh, I said I smell rats. Yeah, a female rat yeah. and a male rat, right? If they want to identify themselves, uh, no. as if they want to identify themselves as rats, I think that's it's fine. very combative and disrespectful. Has your attorney and general aggressive? Has your attorney you address general. our chair in this manner and okay. this board? Let right, me right, move. Let, let me move along. I will not address. Thank you, Susan Case, in that matter again. I have a question mentioned something about rent that Mr. Gonzalez pays. So you he didn't pay. He promised to pay okay, to exactly. make me believe that the rent was going to be paid. I smelled a problem. Better. And I paid the rent the day before default was due. I came before this board on another matter, and two of you, when they saw me there, said they were sorry I was losing my cabin because Mr. Cottrell told them I was going to lose it because it was going to go into default. I said, no, I smelled something, 
and I paid every penny of it. When was the last time you paid rent on this cabin? Uh, every day that I've owned the cabin because of offset of damages under RICO. Okay, so you haven't, I, you haven't paid rent. And you're, you're in arrears. You I have paid a, your concept of rent. I have paid my concept okay, of rent. Thank you. And okay, that do you have another be, question? Pardon? Okay. You were soliciting a... Okay. I was asking the board member if she had a question. Okay. Okay, please so, continue. Let me continue. So, under racketeering influence, corrupt organization, I don't know whether your attorney has told you that I've notified them that we are proceeding under RICO. Damages under RICO are treble damages. When in 1985, Gil and I took everybody's property or they would lose it, that was somewhere between 20 and 25 million dollars. By filing RICO, it's treble damages or up to 75 million. Because you as a board, I believe, were kept in the dark. This meeting was a chance to let you know what you haven't been told by the Attorney General what you haven't been told by Mr. Cottrell, what you haven't been told by Susan Case, as to detailed letters sent saying, I'm not paying rent because you owe me big amounts of money, and I want a hearing before this board. Did I get my hearing? Absolutely not. Did you even know I asked for it? I believe you didn't know. I believe the way DLNR and BLNR under this chair functions is to keep you in the dark. Today, I looked forward to having this hearing. But Mr. Cottrell made sure that I would not have time to put in evidence for you to look at letting me know very last minute that this matter is coming up. Because you will end up personally responsible under Respondent Superiore for damages. That means you, board members, would have to pay the damages under the RICO Act. Nobody can say why citizens should pay them. No, because it's beyond the scope of your authority. If you do not dismiss Mr. Cottrell for his, he knew from July 15th this was going to be an agenda item, and instead of notifying me, didn't do it until what turns out to be the 21st of April this week. Yeah, Member Council, go ahead. So, sir, um, can you, for my own peace of mind, when did you last make a payment? And how much was it for? And how was it made? Okay. Last payment I made, the board will recall, was full rent payment of, I think, 14000 14, something. 14. When I found out that the rent was not going to be paid by Gonzalez. After that, I wrote to your attorney, Attorney General, and said I will not be making any more payments until I have a hearing before the board. Let me let me ask a question of our property managers or uh, parks administrators. What can you just summarize when uh, when rent is paid up through on this lease? Kiki and Corinne might have that last record. I know the arrears is currently $28,000. So in 2019, we received the last payment of approximately $14,000, which was a note. 
in 2019. Now, when my letter went to your attorney saying, I'm not going to pay any more rent, and here's my reason, why didn't you give me a hearing? Why didn't you say, those reasons are nonsense? Please address the chair. Okay. So I'm asking, I'm talking to the board. You're, you're looking at me, but Okay, please. yeah. If, in fact, I'd gotten that hearing, you would have not been kept in the dark. Maybe you aren't in the dark. Maybe you knew all along why I wasn't paying rent. Why didn't you give me a hearing? Because you turn out to be liable once this matter is referred to to the Washington, D.C. federal court and jury. Can I ask you to please explain to me then uh, what, on what basis you think it's uh, right for you not to pay rent on this cabin? Because damages to me caused by you to control. What, what, what are the damages? By not, when I came to you and said, I want to address the board. You said no. And that, that caused you damages relevant to your yes, cabinet? Yes, it caused me damages rent? because I couldn't get the only body, not you, but the only body who could decide whether my reasons for not paying the rent so were what, valid or what, not. What are your reasons for not paying the rent? Oh, you've got it in detail. Uh, it's, uh, been, it's been sent. Please, you please this, in is a, detail. this is a public hearing. Please go ahead and tell us your reasons for okay. not rent. My reasons are the only people who can take away my cabin non-payment of rent is this board. They're the only ones. So I did a couple of things. I went to you to control and said, I want to talk to the board. Well, and they and you said here, no. Here you are. Here you are. So, what is your reason to not pay rent? Because you blocked my appearance before this board until today, when you had no choice. I was unable to get a reading from the board whether or not they believed my reasons were valid. Well, what are your reasons? I told you that, and you haven't it's right. It's circular. I mean, you're, you're, you're yes, saying you the reason get, is that you couldn't you, talk to the board. No, I gave you an answer. Here Would you, you like it again? All right. Well, I'm, my I'm, answer not, I'm, not is, seeing a, I'm not seeing a reason for a justification for you to not pay your rent on the... On the and list. that's why you wouldn't let me go to the board. Here you are. And that's true. That's why you wouldn't let me go to the board. Because you decided oh, that I'm, I, my I'm reason hearing, was I'm hearing invalid. you better right now, so... Okay. So, today, when you check the situation, I trying to get you for your own safety. I believe you were kept in the dark. I believe your Deputy Attorney General did not tell you that this is a RICO matter. Under RICO law, you have to have two violations of government abuse of power against property. And they have to have occurred within a 10-year period. When the first one occurred 10 years ago, we had to go to the Kauai court after trying to resolve it with the, board, the previous board chair. We had to go to the court in Kauai and won our cabin back. They had taken it. We won. Okay. Once that first one occurred, 
Then, under RICO laws, a second one has to occur within that 10-year span. Not only has a second violation of RICO law occurred, but it's occurred eight times, not two. Okay, we have a question from Member Ono. Yes. You mentioned all these times about uh, courts and everything else. Can you give us a specific date? Because it, it's hard to keep track as to where you're going. Yes. What I will do is I'm going to ask you after today to have a hearing on E3. Once you have that hearing, I will have time to put together all of the documents to have the 30 witnesses testify. Then, because Mr. Cottrell decided, even though he knew from July 15th he was going to attempt to take the cabin, I is Mr. For a contested case hearing right now, because if so, then I, I think we should allow him to do so and stop conversation. Is that a, you asked just ask for a hearing, Mr. Lucretio? So, are you asking for a contested case hearing right now? I have to wait before you, don't you put me, I have to wait under your rules to ask for a contested case hearing. No, you can ask for a contested case. Well, I don't know what you're going to do. It's a totally different contested case hearing. If this board says, hey, in 1985, we couldn't take in all that land, that's an illegal RICO violation. And we rescind it, giving all those people. So, so Mr. Chris, you're not yes. asking for a contested case right now? No. If you, will it please you if I ask for one right it's now? Not, it's, no. not, it's not up to me. <laughs> no, I, I'm saying that I will await okay. what you do because it's very different. Well, at this time, I'd like to make a motion to go into executive session uh, pursuant to Section 925A4 HRS in order to consult with our attorney on questions and issues pertaining to the board's powers, duties, privileges, immunities, and liabilities. I object. Here's my reason. Any, any discussion? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right, thank you. We'll be back. You're going into a secret meeting. We're going into executive session. No, you can't go with the attorney general because he knew about the RICO and he covered him up. She covered it up. So that the, the attorney general cannot be your attorney. That's illegal, as RICO will determine. And then you're proceeding to do it anyway. Thank you.
Member Barnes, can you hear us? All right. No. Uh, somebody got audio on over there. Okay. All right. We um, we are back from executive session. We're on item E3, Mr. Lucretio. We'll just give you a couple more minutes. Please state clearly why you believe the forfeiture is uh, un why you believe you are not in default under this lease. Just a couple minutes because you've already had about 15 minutes. Oh. So you're saying that to defend my lot, taking the property, I've only had 15 minutes. It's a pretty straightforward question. You're two, three years behind in your lease rent and... That's what you say and we've disagreed on that. And only one group can find out which of us is right, you or them. Uh, you just committed another RICO violation by going in to executive session to confer with your attorney. Mr. Lucretio, Wait, let you, me finish, please. No, could you please... You won't let me finish? Thank you. Could Thank you me. please explain why you are not in default under the lease? Yes. Hang on one second. As in writing, I sent to you, the Attorney General, detail why well, I'm not in default on my lease. Okay. You submerged it, didn't pass it on to the, oh, here they are, didn't pass it on to the uh, board members, and therefore, the question of whether or not I'm behind in my lease rent payment is unresolved. You're the only ones who can determine whether or not I'm behind once you hear my presentation. That presentation is now told by the chair who has a clear object, objection to her sitting as chair. I would ask that the gavel be taken from Suzanne Case so that Mr. no Lucretio, more... you've asked for time to explain why you're not in default, and we're giving you time, but you are not providing us information, and I'm not going to give you more time if you don't provide us information. You're not going to give me time not, to not, save my property. I am Thank going you. to give you time to say why you are not in default under the lease. Notice to Office of State Attorney General. State Assistant Attorney General assigned to oversee and advise Board of Department of Land and Natural Resources and two staff of DLNR and all parties of said agency acting beyond scope of that authority who will be Mr. Lucretio, do you have copies, copies of that for the board members? I don't. There wasn't time. Are you going to read it? I'm going to read uh, it. All right. Let me, let me have that. I'll make copies for everyone because I don't think we have time for you to read uh, all these pages. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat>
So I'm sorry, we're having trouble with our copier. So, um, Mr. Lemire, I can read it. Let me, if you could just summarize, it looks to me like what you're saying is. Um, well, I, did, I don't want your interpretation. Of what okay, I, then please just summarize. I, I don't want you to read it. Just summarize. In summary, this is a notice to your state attorney general that why I was not paying the rent and asking for a hearing with you so that my belief that you never have been told about this and were intentionally kept in the dark. Okay, so why are you not paying the rent? Just please tell the board members. It's in here. Yeah, please I'm summarize. I'm telling you now. Okay? And please stop interrupting. It, it appears that you're trying to... We have spent an hour on this Oh, item my and, goodness and, gracious. And, and that, I, that property is only worth 900,000 times treble <laughs> is $2.7 And we spent an hour on it. Come on. I, I am not hearing <laughs> why you're not paying the rent. I'm telling you right now, I'm reading it to you. I'll try to give it to you a copy. You had a budget crisis and couldn't afford a good copy yet. Okay. This notice is dealing all and all parties acting down the scope of their authority. Who will be determined to have committed RICO criminal acts in the taking of over $800,000 of property. Under RICO, actions against the person are not criminal acts. Sir, I'm so sorry. Can you please answer the chair's okay, direction? I'm reading it to you. Please, please answer. She asked me to summarize it. I'm summarizing it. Will you make up your minds? Tell us why you haven't been paying us. Okay. This notice is hand-delivered on a long second by registered mail because criminal acts have been alleged to be confirmed, to be confirmed by the Federal District Court of Washington, D.C., you I'm are reference. so evading the question. Answer the question. How would you like me to answer it? Why answer don't I us. try and answer the why? way you'd like it? Okay, why haven't you paid rent since 2019? Just one simple sentence. Because why have you, not paid you owe rent? me big dollars, and I've offset the rent against what you owe me. You... Only. Okay, so and and if you determine not to fix this and take the property, then I will be able to go into the federal court. And by the way, those of you not aware, you can go into two courts 
in the United States. Okay. Yeah, comment. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I have a final comment. So, yeah. to that note, you're <clears throat> saying because you're not making the payments because we, as a board, owe you. Mm -hmm. That's what I heard. Yeah. Is that your answer to that question? Yeah, because you didn't act. Why didn't you act? Because your attorneys never told you. Okay. Maybe they did. I Maybe think, they did. I think we have we will find out. I think we have enough information to take a vote now. Is there, are there, is there any further public testimony on this? Let me check. Yes, there is. Mr. Cottrell, did you want to add something? Uh, yes. Um, I wanted to insert this, and it, it's a technical amendment, and uh, kudos to board member Ono. Uh, the TMK, as listed in the title, is accurate for this lot at Pu'ukapele at 41-4-002-079. In the body of the submittal, it is 4-1-4-002-01. So we need to correct. The title is the has the accurate TMK. So just for the record, we're reconciling the, the TMKs. And then Alan, Alan I think corrected now as part of the agenda. Alan, it is an error. Alan. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I think this might clear a little bit up for the board. The, this it appears to me Mr. Lucricio is is inferring that we owe him money because we took his property. Um, in 2008, November 2008 specifically, Mr. Lucricio signed this lease. This lease has a condition. That reserves the right, reserves the ownership of all improvements of whatever kind or nature, including but not limited to cabins, residences, cesspools, water systems, and piping and fences located on the land prior to or on the commencement date of this lease or constructed during the term of this lease. That seems to address the lease issue as to the ownership of improvements. It, it does All right, not. Is there any it further does not. testimony on this? Can I respond? No. You just had him. I can't respond to a comment made in flagrant error. You can't is it, is take any, the property there? by saying, if you don't sign this, we're going to take your okay. property anyway. Okay. We understand. Okay. Your, we understand. Now, your you position. said. 1985. Yelling doesn't make it any clearer. I'm okay, sorry. so just calm it down a bit. I, I will be calm. Just civilly. We, Honestly, we understand your position. I wonder if you could ask the chair not to quit interrupting you. I would like to in know the if room. there's any further public testimony on this matter. Yes, there is. From anyone? There is just been. <laughs> All right. If not, okay. I'm going to go ahead and call for the vote on this. Okay. Is there a may, I, may I make one statement before you do that? your protection. You just went in to meet with an attorney. No, Mr. In no. an executive session. You went into executive session. Mr. Lucretia, I'm going to ask you to leave the meeting. Under you your rules, I am what going to you discuss we are going to take in a vote executive on session? Are you going to tell me? That's required. That you can tell me what you discussed. Is there a motion to approve the submittal as amended? Is that what you discussed? I make a motion to approve All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, this motion passes. And we're done with each. Now I'll ask for a just in case hearing. All right, we're going to decide this matter right now. You um, can't if I've asked for a contested um, case hearing. We're going to decide whether you have a right to a contested case. Um, uh, I'm going to make a motion to deny your request for a contested case. You haven't heard any evidence why I've got a right oh. to. Okay, please Thank you. let us know why you have a right to a contested case. I have a right to a contested case hearing because you have violated, you now all have violated the Racketeering Influence Corruption Act. Okay. And that gives me a right to augment the record through a contested case hearing. Okay. So that all of the facts are there for the D.C. court and jury to determine that you have joined in. All right. So we are. We are Wait, you're interrupting me again. Really, I, I, I got to be. be I promise I'd be calm. Now, sure, I'll second the motion. Okay. The motion is to deny the contested case. We are quite. Wow. Calm. 
We are quite familiar with the reasons why. No, we no, have a tell second. Me. Tell me why. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Now, Lucretio, here, let me tell you something. You, you have the opportunity to follow up your request for a contested case in writing by filling out a petition and turning it into the board secretary. I, I will. Within 10 days. All right, within 10 days. All right, and we are and done with E3. So oh, I'm going to have to leave. with E3. I'm going to ask you to Because I have. I'm, all right, board members. We're I want to alert you, okay. you of what's been done. And now you're leaving to make sure. I'm very sorry what you did. Some of you are nice people. Have a nice day. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear? 
Amy, can you hear? Yes. Okay, we are back from recess. Are we live on YouTube? Mm -hmm. Okay, we are um, moving now to E1. I have uh, no no further comments. Oh wait, hey, I'm testing. <laughs> Uh, I have no further comments on the submittal of the reassignment. Um, if there's, um, do you have any other questions? Any questions on E1? No. Is there any public testimony on E1? There's... Okay, I have a motion to approve by Ono. Second. Second by Char. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Sorry, Member Barnes, are you? Is up. I think so. Yeah. yeah, sorry, Member Barnes, did, how did you vote on this one? I voted aye. Everyone. Sorry, my internet is being a little yeah. funny. Okay. All right, any opposed? That's unanimous. Okay, E2. Okay, E2 I haven't presented yet, but it's it's another forfeiture of General Lease SP0123, uh, Judith Matthews and Ellen Gallimore White. Uh, once again, similar situation, numerous attempts to contact in arrears, and there is a surety bond of record on file for this uh, forfeiture. Okay, any questions, board members? Move to approve staff recommendation. Any testimony on this? Oh, okay, uh, we have a motion to approve. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, and from Barnes, is an aye. Any opposed? The pass is unanimously. Okay, E4. Okay, finally, for some fun and positive discussion. Um, <laughs> thank you for your stamina and patience. Uh, I'm going to defer once again to Alan and Chipper um, on this one. And we've covered a lot of the, the background up front, but I think there's a few more elements that need to, to be discussed. And I, I do agree. I think the, the, the big issue really is, is how to manage and change the situation regarding the cesspools as, as we you know, come up with a, a, a disposition of time, how long to make it versus who invests in the, the wastewater and whatnot. So with that, Alan, I, I defer to you. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair, board members. Uh, this will bring this this Coca session to a close where we request approval for sale of seven leases up to 20 years at public auction for recreation, recreational residence purposes, Waimea Canyon and Coca State Parks, Kona, Kauai, and ask that you declare the project exempt from the requirements of chapter 343. Um, and just as a note of order, this does include the previous two that we just asked for forfeiture. So the five pre-existing plus these two, and as I mentioned earlier, that will get the entire inventory of vacant cabins out into the public auction and hopefully into um, the qualified hands of applicants who have long waited for this opportunity. And any questions, I'm, I'm willing to entertain okay. them. I have just one question. Okay, so I had one question, uh, Ellen, and it has to do with the um, sewer conversion, uh, septic conversion. And there's one from that list that I noticed that is required, actually, to do the conversion before the remaining uh, properties. Uh, are you going to work on that real soon, too? So we will take this um, permission if granted by you to us and we'll work with the AGs and Department of Health and other agencies to see what we can do. Um, again, there's not a law compelling us yet, but I think we feel it might be appropriate um, to set a precedent and, and create a provision within these leases that requires conversion of the septic tank um, for a either an, a lower upset rent or some other process by which um, we can offset rent. And I, I think that's fair to all. Um, we need to take care of it. If the um, wellhead protection single residence that you're referring to is in a different category, we may have to um, educate potential bidders on what that will take if it's different than the other six. So agreed. Um, morning. I just had a couple questions. So the first one, can you explain how the public auction process goes? Is this an in-person au auction or is it in writing? So 
it it has been in person in the past. Um, and again, the last one we did was 2009, I believe. And uh, I, I was not part of that, but I will be part of this one. Given the virtual world we have uh, migrated to under COVID and beyond, I'm not sure whether we could create a process that would allow it to be virtual. Um, but essentially they all, all the, the vacant lots up for auction um, went up one in succession, one after the other in a public facility on the island of Kauai. And um, barring any changes to that process, we will do that again. Thank you. Uh, one more question. So, you know, you mentioned that on the two defaults that we terminated, there was a surety bond in place. You know, my understanding with the surety bond is um, they need to be renewed every year. So I, I don't know if you have the option to consider a cash bond instead, because it's a lot easier if you have the cash, then you don't have to go hunt the surety company to get the funds. So do you know what you're intending to do as far as the security provisions oh. of your auction? I don't, but I appreciate the advice and we will consult. And I think um, maybe a cash bond is a better way to go um, or some other form that makes it easier for us to collect on these um, defaulted actions in the future. Good, thank you. Other questions? Great, is there public testimony on this? Workman. Yeah, thank you, board. Um, I'll stand on my test written testimony, which you have in front of you. I just want to, um, at the very end of that, I, I noted that even though uh, Kiki and Corrine, the 100%, as, as Kurt referred to, the land management um, are there without saying, um, I strongly encourage this board to do everything it can to encourage the, the division to get these out to auction this year. And I know it's going to be a big push, it's, it, but it really, really, really needs to happen. Um, our leaseholder association, through the really fantastic services of a woman named Chris De La Cruz, who doesn't even have a cabin up there, she joined our, our board and said, I just, I just really want to help take care of, of these cabins that have been run down. I mean, she and her family and, and friends have come in and worked closely with state park staff to clean them up, to get the, uh, the squatters out, the amount of rubbish, you would not believe how many horse trailers of rubbish she's hauled out. Um, and they're cleaned up and they're secure. We need to get them out to auction now while they're in that state um, because state park staff is too limited to be able to maintain them. And so this is really very time sensitive. And, and I know Alan and Kurt understand that um, and I just want to put in a plug for land manager position for Kauai, which, you know, let's get that thing filled because our, our association would love to be able to work with somebody on Kauai to, um, to manage this in the future. You saw through these last agenda items how important it is to have lessees who are engaged and want to do their part. Um, and we as an association stand ready to be a good partner with you folks in, in ensuring that happens. Um, so anyway, thank you for your stamina. Thank you, Alan and Kurt, for getting this on the agenda today. I know it was a push. And if the board approves it, it's going to be even bigger push to get this out there. But anything we can do to support that, we, we stand ready to do so. I'm sure we'll call on you. Like so thank you very much. And I wanted to point out, I, I apologize, in the mayhem of this meeting, I actually meant to acknowledge Chris De La Cruz and her family's efforts as well. They have an adopt the park agreement. Um, so, you know, the, that just shows the love of, of Kokei that many people have, as Chipper pointed out, she doesn't even have her own cabin and just doing it for the, the, the good of us all. So um, public acknowledgement of that was warranted. And then we are working backwards from a proposed auction date of December 8th. I mean, we're gonna do everything we can to hit it. So that is our intent to get it done this year. And um, this was one of those milestones to get this on the agenda today and passed. Thank you. Okay. Is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. D Second. E4. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 And I from Barnes, any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thanks, everyone, for all of your efforts, and KK and Karun for all of your efforts to come. Really appreciate it. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Aloha. 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 Okay, uh, we're going to go to uh, 
Item uh, C. And again, anybody in a real time crunch, let us know, but we're going to go in order for the rest of the agenda otherwise. Um, Mosquitoes now. Wait. There was a, okay. Maybe we should let those folks in. To, uh, he's D4. He's D4. And there's one other person. Michelle Mendez has a video. Can't wait to see videos and send it to me. Oh, babe. <laughs> <laughs> and okay, I think we're good. Wait. Okay, I think we're ready, C1. Josh Atwood, are you presenting C1? Yes, thank you, Chair and members of the board. I'm presenting item C1. This is a request for delegation of authority to the chair to approve uh, the department entering into an agreement with the nonprofit American Bird Conservancy for video production services related to the Birds Not Mosquitoes partnership. Uh, I think the board is probably familiar with the Birds Not Mosquitoes partnership. It's an interagency group that's working on large scale mosquito control uh, possibilities in Hawaii. This agreement would allow us to contribute some state funds that the Hawaii Invasive Species Council at DLNR has approved toward the overall uh, shared project cost. The um, procurement for a video production company is being led by American Bird Conservancy, uh, and the bulk of the cost is also being uh, shouldered by them. This would be uh, the state contribution towards the overall costs. Uh, there should be a, a draft MOA included in the submittal. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. And we have Chris Farmer from the American Bird Conservancy. Do you want to add anything? No. Uh, thank you, Chair Case and the members. Uh, Josh expressed what the MOA is all about. I'm just here as the Hawaii Program Director Director for the American Bird Conservancy and, and can take any questions you have about the project or ABC. Go ahead. So um, my question is, the video, who would be the primary viewing viewing audience? I mean, who would it be shared with? Um, so the video is intended for all residents of Hawaii. Uh, we do anticipate that it would be distributed outside of Hawaii as well. So the kind of the conceptual model that we're following is similar to the Saving Ohia documentary that was produced after the rapid Ohia death um, discovery on Hawaii Island. So we're looking for something kind of similar in quality that explores both the personal connections uh, involved with forest birds in Hawaii and also the science involved in this type of project and anticipate it being uh, distributed broadly through multiple channels. What would you be considering the airlines? You know, a lot of our tourists like to do hiking and visit our trails and stuff. Would, would the airlines be part of that? Potentially, uh, I would say that, you know, maybe I can defer to Chris on this, but we haven't, the group has not procured a production company yet. And so determining the distribution channels will be further uh, along the road. But if we're able to get something uh, into the content systems on airlines, then that would be fantastic, I think. And I would just support Josh that the video we're looking at is going to be roughly a half hour, and so it would be a longer video, but if we could get the airlines to support that, that would be a tremendous asset, and we're looking at all ways to broaden the distribution of this. Other questions? 
Look for the test. Oh wait, um, sorry. There is. I apologize. Uh, I'm sorry, she didn't give me a passcode. Can't pull it up. She put a passcode on it, and I can't. Did she submit written testimony? No. Um. Yes, she did. The email from the when he was against the machine. I can't do the video. She put a passcode on it and she didn't send me a passcode. Uh, check where this is in the testimony. It was just one sentence. <coughs> you want me to read it? Yes, could you please? Yeah. Um, this is from A. Oh, I'm sorry. I got it. I got All right. So oh, you got it? I got it. Well, waiting. Uh, no. Did she call in to the waiting room? Yeah, she did. And, and then she left because she said... All right, why don't you go ahead and read her testimony? Sure. This is from A. Amadin on Wednesday, August 24th, 9-12 in the morning. Please do not, do not allow this totally psychotic idea to release mosquitoes on us. That is all. Mahalo. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, not uh, in in the waiting room to provide public testimony. So um, the testimony is on record. Okay. Any other? Um, there's no further public testimony. Um, board members, any other questions? Okay, if not, is there a motion to approve C1 as submitted? So moved. Second. So second. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Staff is unanimous. Thank you very much. Good luck with it. All right, Mahalo. Thank you. thank you for your support. Thank you. Mahalo. Okay. <laughs> thank you, darling. All right. We're going to do D items. Okay, D1. Okay, D1, uh, board members were asking uh, to cancel a current revocable permit uh, uh, from that is issued to uh, Winif Winifred Sullivan uh, and, and a reissuance to the buyer of the private property, Puaco, Puaco View LLC. Uh, I apologize under submittal. I wanted to make an amendment. Uh, the rent that we actually intended to recommend was going to be based on a 2018 uh, appraisal we had of the property uh, when we went out and blanket appraisaled all of our uh, majority of our, our revocable permits or our sub sub substantial ones anyway. Uh, and uh, 
and we added a cost factor over the years uh, since 2018. And so the recommended recommended rent instead of what is in the submittal uh, is actually seven thousand eight twenty eight point three two per month per year per year. Um, and, and I apologize also for the fact that the ma maps attached does not actually show it, but I actually inquired from my staff and there is what's what's happening in this property, even though it looks pretty big at 22,000 square feet, there's an old, there's a paper road, i.e. government road running right through it. And as chair has come to learn, uh, as everybody else at DLNR, roads are not within the jurisdiction of our department. It is either the county in this case or state DOT. And in this case, it's the county. So in effect, even though the parcel looks large on the map, it's actually pretty much in half with a road in between. And legally, uh, we don't have any jurisdiction over that road section. Um, uh, and so we're requesting uh, the issuance of this revocable permit. Um, there is an issue uh, that, that we were not aware of until discovery later was there was a wall that the, the permittee or the prior owner had built. And so what we're asking also in this, in this submittal is that to add a provision in the permit when it's issued to this new new owner that at the end of the term of the permit, they remove, remove any of the improvements on the property. Uh, other than that, available for questions if you have any. Great questions, board members. <clears throat> I have a question. Um, <clears throat> Russell, would it, an alternative been to sell it as a remnant piece rather than keep yeah. it under lease? We, we, we actually, that was actually, we are our first choice. Um, we, for various reasons, we ended up going this route. I think we can explore, re-explore that again. Uh, we, but that was definitely on the table as far as trying to sell that as a remnant. Normally, abandoned roads or any type of paper road kind of situation, whoever has jurisdiction will sell it. In our case, you know, and we've hit in this on some occasions where when we know the county will not step up and, and, and meanwhile, there's this beyond the road area that is outlined, there is land that is actually technically titled under the, the, the state. And therefore we have disposed of it in that scenario, but we, that's something we definitely would like to do and, and we can entertain, a, you know, possibly coming back later and offering that, going that route. Mm, Mr. Smith. Um, Russell, thank you for your information that you had emailed. Uh, just wanted to give my comments too on the, if you're able to work out a sale, you know, the county is a real property tax assessed value is $1.8 million. So I suggest you sell it as soon as you can because it's kind of essential yeah. to these guys being able to utilize the property. Yeah, uh, uh, a remnant right. sale would be a little different valuation. Like, see, you know, the, the valuation we came up on this RP was based on the restricted use, yeah. And so that there was a 80% as, as Riley, you know, they showed you yesterday, there was 80% discount. Typically on a remnant sale, um, the, the, the valuation would be how much does it improve the value of the abutting buyer? You know, because the requirement of the remnant would be to consolidate into that property. Uh, so there's a little bit different valuation and, and you're right, it might be actually much higher than what we showed on our appraisal, uh, maybe. And I was sure for that, for that reason, I think we need to like look carefully at whether this is appropriate for a remnant sale and what the process would be because it just may be that it's a much, uh, much higher mm -hmm. value parcel and, and, and needs to be, you know, well, shopped around more broadly, uh, and also get comments from from uh, from other agencies. Keeping in mind though, that there is that road going right through, and I'm sorry we don't have that map on this. Yep. Okay, any other questions? Um, we have a uh, David Kapu. Give something you want to add. Uh, aloha, Chair, and aloha, board members. Um, uh, thank you for allowing me to appear today. So, um, uh, I, it, it is correct. The, the submittal comes with a condition. That condition 
we just learned about it because the submittal um, just came to us within the, the past week or so, 10 days. Um, the, the part that causes heartburn for my client, and my client is Poco um, View LLC that owns the old Sullivan estate, um, <clears throat> is that it, it requires them to bear all of the costs of um, removing uh, all of the improvements at the, at the end of the term. Uh, one problem that they have with that is they have no control over when the state might say we're not going to renew. Um, and so we, at this point, um, my client doesn't even know what he's buying into, what the, what the actual cost would be, because he hasn't had an opportunity to take a look at that. Um, he, he did not construct any of the improvements. It's my understanding that those improvements have been on the property for about 38 years. And so it's, it's not anything new. Um, um, as far as a sale is concerned, my client would be interested uh, under chapter 171, if there's remnant, um, it, it has to be offered to the abutting landowner and not all of it would because there's another abutting landowner who may be able to purchase some of this. Um, it's just, it's kind of an odd, odd shape and it actually runs past another owner. And for whatever reason that that was part of the uh, revocable permit to the Sullivans, but my client would be interested in that um, he, he just would have difficulty uh, not understanding what the liability would be as far as the cost would be to him um, in agreeing to remove, because it's a, it's a, long, it's a long wall. Um, it extends uh, quite a ways. Um, there are trees that have been planted along the way. There's, there's a shed, an open, open shed and a, and a trellis. And I understand why the why the state would want um, somebody to have that liability, um, but um, we would ask the board to consider uh, modifying that if they're going to go forward with the um, revocable permit. They, my client does want to have a revocable permit. He's willing to negotiate um, with the state on terms that would be fair um, and equitable, um, and is very much interested in purchasing um, the property. So. If that's a possibility, um, perhaps that would be the route to go. Um, in you know, it, just in a, a gesture of good faith, this RP was supposed to be canceled. I think last September, 2021, there was a requirement that the prior RP holder um, do a phase one. Uh, they didn't want to do the phase one. They refused to do it. My client. Um, stepped up and, and commissioned the phase one. The, the exact executive summary that you have is as a result of the phase one that my client did. Um, since the Sullivans left, he has paid the rent. He has paid the taxes on the property um, just, just in good faith because he understood that, that he would be coming forward and seeking this uh, revocable permit. Um, so um, we are willing to negotiate a revocable permit with the state. Um, we would much prefer purchasing the property, um, but that that condition that's there, the proposed condition, does does create a little bit of a problem for my client. Thank you. And, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, I would just ask uh, Russell Fuji to address that uh, comment. Yeah, I mean, the, the reason we're asking the current permit holder who is the applicant here uh, is because this, uh, to pay for the, the, the demo of any- Can you, can you put your it, microphone closer, closer if to your mouth, If it remains under an RP, uh, is it is because they, you know, our argument would be that they stepped in the shoes of the Sullivans, right? They purchased the property and it appears as far it's as- We still can't hear you, sorry. We, we still can't hear you. Oh, I don't know what to do then. That's better. Hello? Good. Yeah, okay. Better. All right. Yeah, so the, the reason is, is, is as, as far as we can tell, Sullivan's built the wall and they purchased the Sullivan's property and they're seeking a continuation of the revocable permit that was issued to the Sullivan. Um, 
and that is why we're asking the current holder if you you know you, if as a condition of the approval of the permit that it agreed to this condition now having said that i think obviously if we end up proceeding down the road of a potential remnant sale you know it, it may not even be necessary if if in fact as far as with mr Kapu's clients wall i'm assuming is in would be within or at least the wall that was constructed would be within the area that they'd be purchasing uh, if we go that route and and at that point i don't think you know we would have no reason to require the removal but what we're contemplating is we have to get the property back you know say they don't want the rp anymore is that we'd ask for the improvements to be removed and that was the reason for our recommendation uh, you know sure may can i, I can Sure. Yeah, go ahead. So if, if I make a if I make a comment, uh, if I may make a comment. So if there were some assurances that the state wouldn't unilaterally cancel, I mean, I, I understand RPs, right? They're they're a year to year, 30 day cancellation, and um uh and, and then there's terms and conditions, but assuming the terms and conditions were being met by my client, if if there was some assurance that there wouldn't be a unilateral cancellation or termination of that absent violation of the um, uh, the terms and conditions of the RP, it, it, it would make it a little bit easier to for my client to deal with that. And if there was a if we were looking towards moving towards a sale, I think in the interim, I think he would be willing to do that. But, you know, there's going to be a change of administration. I don't know. I mean, that's some one thing that he raised with me is he doesn't know what, what the makeup of the board, the chair is gonna be in the next ad administration. Um, and, and if that's kind of up in the air, he doesn't know what the pleasure of the board at that point might be. And that, that is a concern to him. Thank you. My, my, my comment on his, you know, Mr. Coppa's comment would be, you know, it, it, although I understand he'd like assurances, I don't, I don't know how we can do that under a 30 day revocable permit. All we can say is that the board annually renews those permits annually, once a year, right? We have to take it to the board. And if it gets renewed, typically it's typically it's renewed, it goes on for the whole year, absent any violation or non-payment of rent. It normally goes on. Yeah. Usually if we're coming to terminate, it's because of violation, not so much. I mean, although I can't guarantee it, not so much that it's a change in policy and stuff. But also I don't know. Comment there that, that <clears throat> the um, the board all has staggered terms, and with the exception of the chair, uh, the current members, and there are seven of us, there's six without the chair, will be on board for the foreseeable two, three years uh, going down line. Well, my understanding, because I made the request initially, is that uh, the land division will look at the options of uh, the possibility of the sale, which would, might obviate the situation. Uh, other than that, if there's a matter of a new RP coming up, it'll come back to the same land board, possibly with new one only new member. Can I just add, just so it's on the record, because it's going to be after me, uh, and I did talk to the land division about this. I, I have significant reservations about whether this is a genuine remnant parcel. Because it's a large parcel, it has a, a very large value. And I'm not sure, number one, even if a sale is appropriate, and number two, whether a remnant sale is the right uh, avenue to go for a sale of this piece. It's just this too valuable a piece to, I mean, if it's theft at 1.8 million, then it's got to have value for, for it's, it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not just a tiny little piece of property that's in the way of somebody else's front yard. So, just stating that on the record. Hallstrom's fee value, though, it came up with a different value, like nine, uh, less than nine hundred thousand, just pure fee still, before the discount. Still, it's not like it's not like you know a nine hundred and thirty-four square foot parcel that nobody else can use. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Sure. Okay. 
Um, just want to make a comment. So um, just to disclose, um, David Koppel and I are classmates in high school, but that doesn't impact um, how we would uh, discuss this matter with him. You know, um, David, this is a revocable <laughs> permit, and the um, when the buyer purchased the property last year for $12 million and they paid cash, you know, this RP that was in front of them that provides the access to their property existed. So if they want to continue the use of the wall that is a buffer from the highway noise and the access through this parcel to get to it, it's up to them to accept the, the terms of the revocable permit, which includes the obligation to remove the improvements that the, the buyer of the property, the main house that they purchased, uh, built. So, you know, I, I think that's part of that's part of the deal. You know, I think your your client needs to either take it or leave it. And I think it's fair. I mean, you know how valuable this property is. I think $7,000 a year rent is extremely below market. And I think your client is, I see all the improvements they're doing with the roof and the, the buildings and everything. I mean, they're putting a lot of money in there. This, this is like a high-end short-term vacation rental. So I, I don't think we should be quibbling on this revocable permit issue because this is a very unique once in a lifetime kind of property that needs to be valued and uh, looked at in that manner. Thank you. So just, just to respond, um, um, Riley, the, the, this is not going to be a vacation rental. So the, it is, it was purchased for, for the use of their, their family. Um, and they do have an easement on the far side that was granted uh, originally. Um, it's, it's just that it, you know, to, you're right, to continue using the existing wall um, and the existing um, driveway that, that was put in, they would have, they would have to um, get the permit. But, um, and, I, and I understand, uh, Chair Case, that you, you know, it, it may not be a remnant. I'm not, I'm not sure what it is. I didn't know about the other road that ran through it. Um, but I, I think from a development standpoint, it may be difficult for anyone else to do anything with it because of the SMA um, setbacks. That's not that's not an argument. I'm just saying that that you know that that's the reality that the the client is going through. Um, so, but I but I hear I hear I hear um, Riley, and, and so I can certainly let my let my client know he was. He was uh, waiting online and wanted to participate as well, but had to had to leave, and he apologized for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Member Tanto. Hi, David. How are you? Been a while. So my, you mentioned. Um, yeah, you know. Yes, it's you did. <laughs> so you mentioned David a little bit ago um, renegotiations with the state. Can you tell me a little bit about what you would be renegotiating? So I, I think I think the, my client would have to fully understand what the actual cost would be to remove it. And again, if it never if it never gets there, if we're going down the route of um, uh, a sale, whether it's a remnant, whether it's it's a piece of property that has more value, um, he just needs to understand what he's looking at before he signs the revocable permit. So I don't know what that would cost him um, to remove the wall, to put it in. You know, I, it just says remove it, but it doesn't say what condition uh, it's going to be in. And so that's, that's what I uh, was meant by uh, negotiating that part. Um, I, I certainly, you know, I, I, if, if, if it's a small amount, I think he would be, you know, it wouldn't be that difficult for him to do that. But again, he, he doesn't even know what that cost would be at this point, only because it just, it just came up. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Before we go on chair, I just wanted to clarify just for Mr. Kaapu's uh, consideration is that we do, you know, as a matter of policy, the state doesn't sell land per se. Uh, we do sell remnants though, however. Uh, and, and so, and, and then even if we wanted to sell land, and I think the only time we've done that in the recent years was a portion of non-seeded land out in Kapale for purposes of the Salvation Army's Croc Center. And it was really necessary to hold fee. Uh, but for that, Everything else is just remnants per se, um, and otherwise. And the ledge has also put a, 
um, basically you got to get ledge approval to sell land, the super majority approval, et cetera. Yeah. So anyway, but the remnants do not need that if it's a true remnant. Yes, I, I understood that. Thank you. Okay. Move that we approve the submittal with the amended rent of seven thousand eight hundred twenty-eight thirty-two dollar per year. Thank you. A second. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. We'll move to D two. Uh, D2, uh, board members is from Maui. It's a, a right of entry for this uh, amateur surfing event uh, at Koki Beach. I don't have anything further to explain other than what's in this meeting. Okay, any questions, board members? Chair, I'd like to move to approve staff recommendation. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. D3. D3 is another Maui item, uh, housekeeping matter. We're coming back to amend to refer to the legal reference of 171-53. Our AGs ask that it be officially part of the uh, board approval. Um, it is a, just for background, it is a, it was a, a the board had previously approved the issuance of this uh, easement uh, and, and for this entity and Actually, it had the blessing of OCCL as well, just for your, your knowledge. So it is a limited term easement of 25 years. Nothing further, Chair. Any questions? There's no public testimony on this. Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. E4. E4 is an Oahu uh, request for. Uh, a term easement again for 25 years. We're limiting our shoreline property easements to 25 years. Um, and uh, we added a right of entry and revocable permit plus removal bond requirement in the event the legislature uh, approval or the governor's approval is not obtained. This would be very similar to a C word. Anything shoreline, these shoreline easements all require ledge prior, in addition to land board, ledge prior approval as well as governor's approval. Uh, so this item, together with D5, will be very similar. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have Mr. El Elhoff here. Do you have anything to add? No, I just said I'll uh, appreciate you guys looking at this, and I'll take care of the encroachments and make sure that they're like honor all the requirements. Any questions? Is, is that coastline armored at all? This area, I believe it is, uh, Mr. El Elhoff, can you, you, would you know? I mean, this is Kanye Bay, if I recall, right? Yes, it's uh, Kahanaho Circle. It was an ancient fish pond that became a development between 1949 and 1952. And I believe uh, these encroachments were built at that time. And I uh, got aerial photos showing the history and the first photo that could confirm it was 1967, uh, as far as clarity. Um, and the previous four owners just never dealt with these encroachments. We, we did check with OCCL, and they were okay with the granting of the easement. But if this is anywhere in the Cunningway Bay area, we have a lot of those uh, shoreline easements. Oh, yeah, where... yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, is there a motion to approve D4? Approve. Second. Second. All in favor? Say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. That passes unanimously. D5. D5 is another shoreline uh, term easement, 25 years. Uh, same requirements of a right of entry, revocable permit, and removal bond in the event we don't get ledge or gov approval uh, and we did run this by OCCO and, and they had no problem with the disposition. Nothing further. Okay, questions? Questions? No, oh, sorry, Mr. McBride, did you want to add anything? You're on, you're on mute.
sorry, I, I saw that now. Uh, thank you, Chair Case and board members for hearing this. Um, I, I just, uh, my wife and I are lifetime residents of Hawaii and we bought this property in 2017 uh, and noticed um, that in the shoreline surveys that were done in 83 and 84, an encroachment had uh, been mentioned and that was never resolved. We decided to go forward. Um, one of our neighbors did get an easement uh, on this rock wall, which was built initially uh, in 1946, um, 75 years ago. And then it was improved in 1961 while it was Bishop Estate property. So we're just uh, trying to do the right thing here and um, uh, appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Okay, any questions? There's no other public testimony. All right, second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, D8. D8 is a uh, request for the issuance of a right of entry and revocable permit to uh, Cozy at Punalu. Uh, it, it's a short term uh, item that apparently OCCL uh, had an agreement with the owner that they were supposed to remove some uh, a temporary erosion control structure. Uh, the time period I think elapsed and so we're coming back for issuance of a right of entry and permit for them to go in, remove the temporary erosion control measure, and then place something temporarily there uh, at the end. Supposedly the term of this right of entry and revocable permit is supposed to end in 2024. It's a little, little unusual one, but it, it is something that uh, was in, this disposition is in connection with what is being acquired by OCCL. And so we're just following through. Thank you. Mr. Overton, did you want to add anything? Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning. Well, no, it's good afternoon, Chair and uh, board members. Thanks. Just some brief comments. I uh, appreciate uh, the efforts by the Land Division, uh, Russell and your team in helping us coordinate this uh, as, uh, as, as well as OCCL and that team. It has been a long road. Uh, as you recall, we got an extension to what was the uh, uh, timetable that was back in the spring. And uh, we thought October 1st was way out there, but here we are now uh, getting the revocable permit, hopefully today. We would really appreciate that uh, on behalf of the owners, Doug and Marie Johnson. Uh, that would give us five weeks to basically remedy what Russell just described, the removal, as well as the reconstruction of a permitted temporary erosion control feature that has a lifespan as described. So. We'd appreciate uh, your support on this, and I'm available for questions. Small. Thank you. No other public testimony. Any questions, board members? Uh, is there a motion to approve D8 to submit it? So moved. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, uh, that passes unanimously. Thank you. Mahalo. Thank you, Land Division. Okay, thanks. Um, Thank Chair, you. Before, also, um, before you sign off, I know what we have had and are probably going to continue to have a lot of these um, coastline and coastal erosion related um, cases come before us. So um, I, I would benefit either from a, just an informational session at some point in a meeting on sort of the suite of policies around it, or maybe we could just um, do a workshop for me or any other board member. Um, cause I feel like we're evaluating a lot of different cases with a lot of different, um, details. And so just being able to understand how we're holding all of these to the same standard would be really helpful for me. Okay. Maybe, a uh, a private session with who, you yourself and whoever, at least we can actually have two land board members at a time. Yeah. So, yeah. And whoever else is interested. Okay. How about Thank if you, you do, do that and then, you know, if it seems like there's something broader that, uh, that I, I know we've had briefings by OCCL and 
but I think uh, Member Barnes is trying to connect the, the land division side of it with the OCCL side of it. So right, right. If, if during those briefings you think there's something that would benefit from a, a broader discussion, we'll, we'll go ahead and do an information yeah. briefing. And, and, and just real quickly, aside from just to answer, Dali, uh, make you rest assured we're not granting new construction. A lot of, almost all of them are old existing walls that we're discovering encroaches within the shoreline, either we're only discovering it now or because of, you know, the, the it's eroding, the shoreline is eroding and it's getting more inland. Um, and and almost always we will be seeking comment and approve an okay from OCCL before moving forward on a formal land disposition. But, but yeah, we can, yeah, I'll, I'll be- Yeah, uh, I hear that Russell, but I think I would like an IB because it's existing wall, but you know, people do crazy things, right? So. Yeah, there is some stuff and, going yeah. out there, and what are what are our, our policies, right? So okay. I'd like to hear that. Yeah. One okay. additional point: uh, it may be helpful to have OCCL mm -hmm. take two members on tour. Uh, I did have a tour a couple of weeks ago, and that really added to my uh, understanding and appreciation. Uh, Rocky Point, Konolu, Aula. <laughs> Um, and it really is almost necessary for you to to see it and the different aspects on the different uh, shoreline as you come around the island to make sense of these policy uh, issues as well. So I commend uh, if something can be set up, I understand it can only be two at a time, but OCCL uh, did take me on tour and it was Really helpful. Very good. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Land Division. Okay. All right, thank okay, you. Okay, we are going to move on to um, Section F. Darlene, we have uh, somebody in the waiting room for F, but it looks like it was supposed to be C1. So, Lainey. Lainey, Lainey Barry, and Barry. Anthony Oligarno. I'm going to let them in and they can bump out if they want. All right. Uh, Mr. Nielsen, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Aloha, Chair, Board Members, Brian Nielsen, Administrator for Division of Park Resources. Uh, also joined by Anthony Oligario and Lainey Berry, um, who are the DAR and DOFA project leads um, related to this agenda item. But uh, we're requesting today for approval to uh, use a request for interest for grants administered by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, also known as NIFWIF, uh, for the America the Beautiful Challenge Program and also a delegation of authority to the chairperson to award, execute, and extend agreements uh, with successful providers and to issue annual requests for interest and awards under this grant program. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions, thanks. Okay, any questions? No public testimony, anybody else wanna add anything? Nope, your motion to approve F1 is submitted. Motion to approve is submitted. By Barnes, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes. F2, thank you. F2. Uh, hi, Chair Case and members of the board. Uh, my name is Kathy Gaywicki. I'm an aquatic biologist with Division of Aquatic Resources. And uh, today I'm presenting item F2 for DAR. F2 is a request for for authorization and approval to issue an amendment to the current Papahanao Mukuakea Marine National Monument Conservation and Management Permit. Uh, for Dr. Michelle Barbieri Lino of uh, the NOAA Pacific Islands Fishery Science Center for access to state waters to conduct Hawaiian monk seal management and recovery activities. Um, I can provide more information on the modifications if you guys want, or um, I don't know if you have any questions. All right, any questions, board members? Mr. Smith. Um, you know, I'm just. When I was reading this enclosure, I just wasn't clear. So part of this item is to remove aggressive sharks from the area. 
the that part of the title is um, to kind of provide transparency about an activity that is included in the overall uh, management activities and program for for the whole program. That is an activity that is conducted, but the, this amendment is not including any of those activities. Um, but it but that is an activity that is um, included when it's necessary. Uh, it's, it's just you know that caught my attention. It just seemed a little arbitrary, and I was just wondering if you're out in the ocean and you're either on a boat or in the ocean, how do you um, remove a shark, or how do you dispose of the shark? Or what's the process? Um, I would have to refer back to the. Um, original board seminal to get the complete information. But as, as far as I understand it, um, it these are, um, that activity is is aimed, it's, tar it's targeted at specific sharks that have been displaying aggressive behavior um, towards monk seal pups. So they they observe and, um, and try to identify which shark may be uh, an issue shark. And then um, I believe that they, um, they catch it with uh, I think it's baited hook and line, and um, and I, I don't know actually what the um, how they sacrifice it, but they um, they, I th they do it in the most humanely humane possible way I think possible. So um, I can pr I can review that activity and, and give you more information um, at a later date. I was just date. wondering. It, it, yeah, it just seemed like um, if you're targeting a specific shark to throw baited line in the ocean you may not get the shark that you're trying to eradicate to bite so, the hook. So I will say this is a pretty detailed um, and, and ongoing activity that um, does come before the board every year. And maybe I just say the next time it comes before the board, um, it might be worth a, a, a more detailed, we have new board members, it might be worth a more detailed uh, explanation of why, where, when, you know, what are the restrictions, how does it, how's it done, just so everybody's current on that method of controlling problem, problem sharks when um, monk seals are at risk. Oh, good. It, it, it is a very targeted activity okay. and very minimally used, um, okay. the whole science around it. Okay. And my comment, you know, the monk seals are endangered species and the sharks are not, so I'm, I'm fine with it. I was just wondering how they... Yeah, so it's, it's worth uh, just a, a more detailed... Uh, uh, I don't think we've done that in a couple of years, so... Thank you. I'm good. Yeah, and I can also um, just um, ex take a excerpt from the, the previous board submittal and send you that over email, um, if that helps as well. But uh, yeah, just to explain, the reason why it's part of the, of the title is because it's been a an issue that's been discussed over and over again in, in the past. And so it's kind of to provide transparency as, as being part of the activity. Uh, but the, this amendment is just to um, add people, add uh, five additional personnel and to allow um, refueling operations in near shore waters. Motion to approve F2. So moved. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Sorry, Member Barnes. Mr. Um, sorry, I just was a little confused. Is this a, 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 to approve five people or to approve Miss Lino? Um, it's a, to approve. Uh, originally, the request was to have 25 people under, authorized under this permit, and uh, this is to add five additional personnel because they need to uh, basically change out um, some some roles um, that already exist uh, with new personnel. Got it. So the permit is to her, and within her research team, there are four other people, or. Sorry, I just... there are 25 people authorized under the permit right now, and they need to add five people. So that would make a um, the allowable amount of people 30 people total. Thank you. Uh, throughout, I don't think um, I don't know how many are up there at one time, but it's it's throughout um, the various periods of time they conduct base camps throughout the year. 
Okay. Great. Yeah. I, I'm fine to vote to approve. Thank you for that clarification. Great. That passes unanimously then. Thank you all very much. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Okay, board members. Um, I, I'm actually going to suggest we take a lunch break before the J items, um, just because the J items involve one uh, a little bit longer briefing and and then the um, and then one thing. I mean, we we could go ahead with it if you want, but up to you. We have number six also. No, that's no. we're going to defer that until a future meeting. What? Yeah, and we have a lunch discussion to have. Good? All right. We'll take a lunch break then. Thank you. Another meeting.
the hour. <laughs> All right. See if she can hear us, Amy. Uh, wait, I have to sign back in. We have to can sign you, back in? Yes, oh. oh. Amy, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Great. <clears throat> nice backdrop, yes, nice, whatever mm -hmm. that is. What do you mean, whatever that is? It's all here. Yeah, I, I signed up. Really? Sure you know this is the board of land and natural resources. <laughs> That's all here. That's all here. Not all there, all here. I don't know it to be that. Well, it's, it's blown up. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's very vibrant. Three times the size of her head. So. <laughs> This is the one to think about. Are we live? Yeah. Are we live? Yeah. <laughs> are we live? I was talking about a backdrop. Yeah. Guys, we're live. Wait. Oh, we're live. Huge. Well, yeah. Okay. It is being recorded. Sorry. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay, we are uh, doing our last section, the J section, uh, and we're going to go um, first J2 and then J1. Take it away, Mr. Underwood. Hey, good afternoon, Chair Case and board members. Ed Underwood, Administrator with the Division of Boating and Ocean Recreation. Um, I'd like to start off by just giving a, a brief history of what's transpired to date. So the new board members know what we've been doing with the Alawai Small Boat Harbor. So back in 2009, we initially went out for request for proposals, and this was only for the for two sites in the harbor that were currently or had just been under lease. That's the haul out site by the bridge and the fuel dock site. So we went out for an RFP. A company called Honeybee was selected. Um, went through the process, issued a lease, and just after issuing the lease, the company lost its financing and ended up going bankrupt. So we had to go back to the drawing board. And at that time, uh, we had gotten um, comments from the public that there wasn't enough public outreach done. So we hired a company called DTL. They went out and did public outreach for the harbor. Um, these, this company was recommended to us by HCDA, who had done the Kewalo Basin Small Boat Harbor. So we took that, um, that report and we went out again for an RFP for the facility. Uh, and this time it included the, all the fast lands in the harbor. That is the two sites from the initial RFP the harbor master site, which is the large area in the center of the harbor, um, and all of the moles, anything that's basically dry land in the harbor was included in this um, RFP. So we went out for the RFP. We had one responsive bidder and one bidder that um, didn't meet the deadlines, um, but the selection committee reviewed the proposals and decided they did not meet what we were looking for. Um, we did hear that several um, developers decided not to bid on the project. So what we did is we met with those folks to find out, well, what were their concerns with um, bidding or putting in a proposal? Um, one of the things that came out was the, the proposal was, what we were asking was too broad. It, it would basically just said, give us an I give us a plan and we'll look at it. And they felt that we needed to have um, to narrow that focus more. Um, so around this time, we had uh, become aware that the University of Hawaii was looking to do a summer program uh, for their students. And they were looking for a, a site or an area to do this uh, summer program with. And we were in touch with, we got in touch with a Miss Phoebe White. She's on she rep she's with the University of Hawaii. She's on the um, board meeting here. So we work with them and we did a summer project. And the students did a great job, we thought. They really thought out of the box, um, great ideas. So we work with them to do a more formalized vision plan for the facility. And what we had asked was if they would really focus in on the, what the community um, all the community outreach had come up with. Um, 
that you know what the boaters were asking for um, and that this project also comply with all the zoning requirements in the area and such. So they went off and they did this um, and they completed the this um, vision plan, which you folks probably have seen. It's a pretty large plan, so it was it's on our website, and I believe the links were sent to you folks to to see. And um, we feel that this really does give some guidance to anybody interested in coming into the facility um, and what we're looking to be built there. And we wanted to take a holistic approach. We're looking to tie that whole area of Waikiki together from Alam the Alamoana Beach Park side, the lay of green that's been contemplated, the boardwalks going through the harbor and then tying into the other side of the Hilton Lagoon property. And also this, what this project will do is it will open up more opportunities for our local residents to enjoy Waikiki area. Because right now it's mostly tourism, but this, this would open it up for a lot of our local community to use as well. Um, we, there's, there's two sites we can, Todd, can you go to the next side? So this map shows you approximately where, where, where the Alawai Small Boat Harbor is on the island of Oahu. And next, Todd. Um, during this process, uh, University of Hawaii did numerous outreach again with stakeholder groups, gathered all that input, combined it with what the DTL report had, and came up with this vision plan. Next, Todd. So this is the Alawai Boat Harbor that we're discussing. In blue, you'll see this is all of the area of land that's in, contained in this development proposal, what we're going out with. It's basically everything in the harbor that's not on water. We would really have preferred to put the entire facility out on a, um, a request for proposals, including the submerged lands, um, but we weren't successful at the legislature to get that authority. So we can only focus on the fast lands. Next, Todd. So this is option A. You'll see that there's a lot of green space, uh, watercraft park, uh, places for the public. Um, we think this is well thought out as well. Uh, however, the biggest concern we have with option A is if you see right in the center where it says watercraft park, that is gonna take away a lot of parking. Um, we currently have approximately 900 parking stalls in the facility and we really can't afford to lose any additional parking. If anything, we need more parking. So next, Todd. So this is option B, and you'll see in that same area in the center, the watercraft park, there is a proposed parking garage. And we, we support this idea more um, because we, we can ensure that the num at least the number of parking stalls now remain the same, or we may be able to increase the number of those parking stalls in the facility. So what, what we'd like to do, if you know, answer any questions the board would have on this plan put together by uh, University of Hawaii, uh, Ms. Phoebe White, that we, we work through the Community Design Center, School of Architecture, and the Department of Urban and Regional Planning as well. And take this concept out to a developer to see if this is something feasible that can be built in the harbor or if they recommend changes. Because ultimately in the end, it's gotta be self-sustaining or, or it's not, not gonna work. So with that, we can answer any questions you have. And again, Ms. Phoebe White is here joining us uh, from the University of Hawaii, and she's willing to answer questions as well. Okay, thank you. All right, questions, um, board members. Chair? Yeah. Uh, so establish a selection committee. W where would these members um, come from? The general public or? 
Yeah, we already have a selection committee established from the last RFP that we would like to work with. They are members of the public. They're, um, we did not let the names out because we didn't want you know, everybody calling these folks and trying to sway their decision making. Um, there's members from government offices as well that have an interest in this area. So we feel we have a strong selection committee that can really review and analyze any proposals we receive. Ed or Phoebe, what was the <clears throat> was the sea level rise contemplated in the design process? Yes, it was. And uh, Phoebe, you might want to add to that. Um, yes, absolutely. Sea level rise was um, considered. the The whole vision report is essentially a series of um, guiding design principles and concepts. And one of the elements of that is sea level rise adaptation. So both options um, consider and propose different sea level rise adaptation strategies uh, be required as part of you know the RFPs that will be put out and different timescales for adaptation. So more immediate adaptation needs and then also thinking about longer term. Yeah, just one question. So, um, Ed, based on your presentation, the RFP will inform those that may be interested. They can either choose option A, they could choose option B, or they can propose something that's different. So, it, you're really allowing the free market to decide what they may feel is viable and what they can afford to um, pay for the development rights of this area. Is that accurate? Yes, with basically within the guidelines, you know, within of the vision report, because we don't want somebody to come in, and this was a concern in the past, and propose to build a 50 story high rise in the center of the harbor. Um, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for something that integrates the boating community, the local community, and ties all of Waikiki together. So either your RFP is going to be successful or you may not get any responses and then you'd have to reassess what to do next. Yeah, That is correct. And that is a concern we do have. As I was stating earlier, if, if we were able to do the entire harbor like um, uh, Howard Hughes did with Kewalo Basin, I think we'd have a lot more interested parties. Um, but we want to go out and see if, if this is a viable um, project for a developer. And then if not, we're going to just have to come back to the drawing board and maybe reconsider how we're going to move forward with the Alawai Small Boat Arbor. Sounds good. You got to do something. So I think this is a great first step. Thank you. And can I ask um, a couple of questions to you and Phoebe? Um, one question I had, I know when we were looking at the Blue Water Shrimp proposal previously, there were some concerns about the increase in traffic associated with doing some of the development there. And so I'm just wondering if there have been additional traffic study or traffic considerations in the design process here. And particularly if we're one of the options envisions adding parking to the area I'm just curious sort of like how, whether and how that was considered and what your thoughts are on, on that. Um, so for this one, we're working with the county's uh, public precinct, DPP's public precinct um, and answering their questions. We did not conduct a traffic study for that area on this RP. Um, I'm not sure if Ms. White's team looked at the traffic in that, in that part of the harbor? No, but as we did um, do field survey of the parking numbers, but it is a suggestion of the vision report that a more in-depth uh, traffic study be conducted. So we that is a future consideration and study that we think is definitely needed <clears throat> for the harbor. I'd like to just comment and uh, applaud Ed's 
uh, division and the university for the report. Uh, as I looked at the vision report, I was uh, very impressed with the, the breadth of the report. <clears throat> I think <clears throat> rather than just looking at one site like the Honeybee site, it really makes sense to have the entire area looked at. And I did a step further because I think that in this vision report, there are three additional gateways that this is central to those three other areas that can and should be tied together. One is the Ala Moana Beach Park, which is right next door, which has some parking potential, but is known for the locals, for the us local users. The second is the gateway for the Alawai Canal, because it empties right into this. And I'm thinking, for instance, the promenade at the convention center, which is way underused. The convention center parking lot, which is way underused, and somehow tying that gateway into this area, like maybe a, a San Antonio River Walk or a, a ferry system from the convention center area all the way into this area. The third thing that uh, excited me the most was that I think there needs to be a buyback from the tourist areas uh, that's kind of encroached in the entire um, Hilton side. Um, right now, the surfers are there and they're dearly holding on to the parking spaces. Um, as I looked at it, <clears throat> however, uh, it really opened my mind that the, the overhang of the Ilikai belongs to the state and is a huge potential. And presently, as I walked up there the other day, it looks like the hotel has kind of taken it over, so the locals don't really realize that they have a walking path on that overpass. And the other thing is the Hilton Hawaiian Village. Um, the lagoon area really belongs to the state under um, some management by the Hilton, and they've done a good job of keeping that area open. But the perception is that that's owned by the the hotel and not the public, all the way out to that boat dock there. But I think in composite, it's it's a tremendous potential for a developer, and I'm very excited to uh, support the this request for proposals and and whether it's feasible or not, but potentially get additional ideas uh, of what they think can be done. With this area. It is way underused right now. There's parking spaces that's for the permits that aren't used during the daytime for the boulders. There's a crush of parking for the uh, Warren Village side where the surfers go out, but that's not fully utilized. And somehow, and, and same with the, the boulders there, somehow if that can be integrated in some fashion, in a more productive, usable um, situation, and maybe the parking lot may be a good thing. Uh, I w would be really curious to see what comes up with these proposals. So, again, commend both of you and uh, hope we can go forward and get more on this. I think we can turn this area centrally back to the public and tie Waikiki to the Alawai, to Ala Moana Beach Park. And that would be my goal as I look at this. Thank you. Other questions or comments? I just had one other comment. Um, sorry, I was on mute afterwards. Thank you, Ed, for your answer. And I really like what a member Char just noted um, uh, in terms of the idea of this sort of being a place that can tie other places together in the area. And I think uh, my thinking about the, the idea of adding a parking lot here is almost the inverse to 
what he described, which is that if you can't integrate that, maybe you don't need to add new parking. And I think also as we think about mode shift, thinking about ways to get people out of their cars and really like walking and biking, or I think member chair mentioned like even you know, using the waterways for water taxis or other ways of getting around, I think would be really great. And, um, you know, my, my kids go to the, to, um, Waterman's Academy, um, at the yacht club and it's, it is not a super conducive place to driving around, um, even now with like pretty limited traffic. So I think the more we can encourage people to get out of their cars and on foot or getting around other ways would be great. Um, and then my only other question, um, Ed, was just about the Yacht Club itself. Um, I mean, as I said, I I'm have so, I'm self-interested here, but um, it's a great camp and program that is provided for the community. They're really helping kids develop um, competence and strength in the water. And I know that lease is coming up. So I'm just, I guess I'm curious about what you know, role for, for that space in in this plan. Uh, the Waikiki Yacht Club wasn't included in this plan, but we've always envisioned it being a yacht club there. Um, I think they have some years left on their lease, but I can confirm. Um, but that's, you know, the Waikiki Yacht Club is a great example. There are lessee and they, they manage that facility on their own and they keep it clean. They keep, they make the repairs when they need to make the repairs. They can hire staff when they need to hire. They can procure. Um, that's the model we'd like to do with the Alawai, in fact. But um, no, they're, we always intend to have that as a, a yacht club. And it's under lease, right? It is. It says 32434 in the exhibit here. They did come to us. They were proposing to do um additional improvements this was a couple of years ago and we're requesting to extend the term of the lease so they could amortize the new improvements but we haven't talked to them for several years now so i'm not sure where they're at on that thank you all right, uh, Ed, thank you for that. Let's see, Do we, I don't think we have any other public testimony or um, like anything else you wanted to add at this point? Well, only that we'd like to thank Phoebe and her crew. They did a great job. We really liked working with them and hopefully we can work together in the future on other projects. Totally agreed. We very much enjoyed this project and um, you know, understand and realize its significance, especially in the South Shore of Oahu. So as a coastal public space. So thank you for thank having you for all, of, all of that us. great work. Okay, why don't we just turn to J1 then? Uh, there's an action item. Wait, I, I think you went on mute, Ed. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, we're asking that the board on J1 authorize us to proceed again with a request for proposals based on the Alawai vision plan produced by the University of Hawaii um, to see what type of proposals we can get back. Any questions? Any further public testimony? I move approval of the staff recommendation. All right. Second. Great. All then in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. That brings us to the end of our agenda. And Thank you all. Get the gavel. Thank you all. Thank you all very have much. a great Thanks weekend. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Uh, <clears throat> it's a great